Uh, it's on the time, and I'm looking, and I think most members are with us. Uh, can I ask the chief executives to take us through agenda items one and two, please? Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, members. <clears throat> to all members of Governance and Strategic Planning Committee, you're hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee to be held remotely today, Tuesday, the third, 30th of March, 2021, at four o'clock. Alderman Bresland? Here, John. Alderman Hussey? Hi, thanks, John. Alderman McClintock? Apologies, please, John, for Alderman. having Thank you. And obviously, that's yourself, Alderman McCready. Um, Councillor John Boyle? He's one of the John will be with us shortly. Thank you. Councillor Michaela Boyle? And sure, John. Councillor Cooper? And sure, John. Councillor Donnelly? John. Sorry. Councillor Gower here. Uh, Councillor Donnelly's running late. I believe it'll be okay. Thank you, Councillor Gower. Councillor Duffy? No. Councillor Fleming? <clears throat> Councillor Paul Fleming? Um, and Paul was having um, some technical issues earlier, so it could be just he's having difficulty getting on. Okay, thank you. And um, you're here, Councillor Gallagher. Thank you. Councillor McKeever? Here, John. Councillor Mooney? John. Councillor Riley, thank you. You're here, here John. John. Yeah. That's back to you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief Executive. Uh, members, I'd like to remind everyone who's in remote attendance, this meeting will be broadcast live by the Council's YouTube channel. will also be available for viewing by the public and media. The broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. Uh, this broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with Council protocol. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics on and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. A copy of our Council's privacy notice may be found on the Council website www.terrystraban.com. Com, uh, sorry, dot com. Uh, members and uh, guests, you're all very, very welcome. I, with regard to declarations of interest, if those can be put in the chat box or if a particular declaration arises uh, at any item on the agenda, you're very welcome to declare them at that stage. And with that, I'm moving to item five on the agenda, uh, which is a presentation. Uh, it's Molt Ben Vutgut. Uh, gracias por la tarea asistencia. Uh, forgive my uh, cumbersome attempt at Catalan as opposed to Spanish, uh, but you're very welcome. Uh, I'm presuming it's uh, Carlos who is making the verbal overview on the Catalan conflict. Is that correct? You're very welcome, sir. And I hand over to yourself uh, to present to Council, and following that, Councillors will have the opportunity to uh, interact with yourself on your presentation. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everybody, uh, distinguished, distinguished members of Terry City and Strabane District Council. First of all, I'm very grateful and honored to be invited here and have the opportunity to talk to you all. Please also let me thank you personally for the support that the Derry City and Stravenis District Council gave, gave the people of Catalonia in the motion it faced on 24th October 2019. To show your solidarity with my country and its democratic demand for self-determination and independence, while also calling on the Spanish authorities to end their campaign of violence and criminalization aimed at the peaceful Catalan movement. However, a year and a half later, 
the situation has not improved. And in the 21st century, in the European Union, is standing by as one of its member states, Spain, uh, holds politish, political prisoners uh, in cells and forces politicians into exile abroad. Some members of the government of Catalonia, that I headed from 2016 and 2017, are in prison. And others, like myself, are in exile because democracy in Spain is at stake. And this is a threat not only for Catalonia, but for the whole of Europe. In response to our will to exercise the right of self-determination as enshrined international covenant on civil and political rights, a general assault has been launched against the legitimate ideal of independence which is the political option of the majority in Catalonia. Looking at the latest uh, Catalan elections held on the 14th of February, the people of Catalonia once again gave a new absolute majority in the Catalan parliament to pro-independence parties in terms of the number of seats. Moreover, for the first time, the votes for pro-independence political parties faced the 50% threshold reaching 51.7%. Uh, I'm a political exile, but they do not persecute me just because of who I am, but more importantly, for what I represent. They want to make it clear that this persecution whether it be in the form of political disqualification, exile, imprisonment, and even in the tragic case of my predecessor, President Luis Cumpanj, in 1940, in the form of a firing squad, in all is all in the name of the unity of the Spanish state. In Brussels, here in Belgium, from the heart of the European Union, we have denounced this democratic anomaly in the European Parliament and from the Council for the Catalan Republic, the political institution of which I am the president, Spain continues the sinister tradition that it has upheld almost without interruption over the past century, the political repression of Catalonia's highest political institution. We have no doubt that the the ultimate objective of the Spanish state, all the way from the king down to the judge and public prosecutors, is not simply to prosecute us personally through criminal proceedings, but rather to frighten, intimidate, and eventually paralyze the aspirations for freedom of the majority of the citizens of Catalonia. More than 3,000 people in Catalonia have been victims of a Spanish repression. Some of them were victims of police violence, and among of the 3,000, many of them are currently facing persecution or judicial investigation. Can you imagine? And this is happening in the heart of European Union. In response to our shared conviction that Catalan is a nation, and as such, as an absolute right to govern itself, Spain's only tactic has been to punish to the limit of its powers. When in September 2016, as president of the government of Catalonia, I announced to my country's parliament that the way to resolve Catalonia's relationship with Spain was through a self-determination referendum, I was underlining two principles to the international community. Firstly, that the decision as to what form of Catalonia should take as a country had to be made by its citizens through a referendum. And secondly, that political conflicts in Catalonia or everywhere else in the world can only be resolved through democratic means. On behalf of all Catalans, I can clearly state that at no time has anybody 
distressed even a millimeter for our commitment to these two principles. Those who hope to see us disintegrate, disappear, or become discouraged should rest assured that we shall continue to uphold and exercise our essential responsibility, whatever needed in order to find a democratic solution. Catalonia is a land of understanding and dialogue. We do not know how to do things any other way. We are a thousand year old nation that has certainly faced more than its fair share of attacks throughout history, but our triumph is our refusal ever to fall into trap of violence. We will never be defeat, despite, despite the relentless, aggressive, hard repression we have faced, we are still here. Today, I'm here explaining the political situation of my country to you, the government of uh, Terry, discussing, reasoning, and also accepting some very legitimate criticism, but always within the framework of dialogue. I want to emphasize that none of our political prisoners or the exiles has abandoned the objective of living an independent Catalan Republic in alliance with the free nations of the world. Personally, it fills me with emotion that none of the people persecuted by the apparatus of the Spanish state has not renounced their commitment to fight politically to achieve this objective. The people who will one day have to answer to history and specifically to the international courts are those responsible for senten sentencing my colleagues and friends to 100 years in prison, the same people who gave the orders to the police who came to Catalonia on the 1st of October 2017 when we held the referendum on self-determination with the sole purpose of viciously attacking our fellow citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a defending feature of modern Europe democracies that political conflicts are resolved with political solutions, always shunning violence. When faced with a problem, you discuss, analyze the scenarios and reach agreements. Any attempt to equate political issue with a problem of a different nature is a mistake that hinders the possibility of finding a peaceful resolution. I have to say that the fact that the Spanish state has so far rejected European democracy's formula for conflict resolution is not due to a lack of talent, but rather to an excess of obduracy and perhaps of pride and self-importance as well. The difference in the case of Spain is not that there is more or less talent for imagining solution than in your country, for example, but rather it is Spain's attitude at the lack of will on its part. Unfortunately, the European Union continues to keep a low profile, which uh, is grateful show of hypocrisy. I'm certain that ending the repression will create the conditions required for the political resolution of the Catalan conflict. It is extremely hard to sit down and talk to people who use the police and legal system as a threat to intimidate their opponent. Replacing, replacing politics with the criminal code and restoring the use of judge and police rather than governments and parliaments has been one of the Spanish state's huge mistakes. I stand before you as a 130th president of Catalonia and MEP who proposes building a way forward. We always make proposals. We propose building a fairer and more democratic independent European state. We are willing for our proposals to fail because we 
value democracy equally to or more than our country's freedom. That is why we held a referendum in which everybody could vote and decide their, their collect, collective future. We will not stop demanding democracy, the democratic banking of the European Union. A few days ago, 42% of the members of the European Parliament told Spain that it cannot carry on doing things the way it has been. And let me say here that without Brexit, the proportion will have been much higher than 42%. The discussion over the request to withdraw the parliamentary immunity granted to us as MEPs has generated a political debate about the situation of Catalan in Brussels. Almost 300 MEPs rejected the judicial approach that Spain advocates. A wall that seemed very solid is starting to show cracks. However, we have to acknowledge that the approval of the request, albeit with less support than Spain expected, represents a defeat for democracy in the European Union. The European Parliament as an institution cannot continue being far removed from the reality of our times. We demand that it reforms its status as an authentic democratic assembly of representatives capable of finding political solutions when the dignity of millions of people comes under attack, as it happened in Catalonia. In the motion based by this Dairy City and Savane District Council, you called upon the European Union to end its silence and complicity with the Spanish government's violent repression, denial of democratic, democratic rights, and now imprisonment of Catalan leaders. Unfortunately, the European Union, through its political institutions, has so far failed to do so. Instead, it has chosen to take the sentence of a close club of European states rather than a regional federation formed of citizens. After Brexit, I beg you to continue pressing the UK government as well. Europe has fallen short in response to the Catalan political conflict as right now there are politi political prisoners in the Spanish prisons and hundreds of Catalan citizens are still being criminally persecuted simply for being for independence or even more outrageously for tweets or songs that criticize the Spanish royal family. This is the crude reality of which the European Union ought to be ashamed as, a, as an accomplice to a wave of oppression against the most fundamental individual and collective freedom. But, but we do not give up hope. We believe that Catalonia is an opportunity for Europe and the world to demonstrate that borders are not sacred and that they are created, erased and modified only by the will of the citizens themselves. Europe as a whole, the European Union and the United Kingdom has to fully defend democracy and human rights within its own borders as well, if it wants to continue being a key player at the global level. Uh, can can I, sorry, can I interrupt? Can we bring your presentation? I'm, I'm sure you're heading there, but can we move to a conclusion? I'm very keen that members may wish to speak to you uh, yourself. So if you can draw your remarks to a conclusion, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I will finish uh, very quickly. The democratic movement in Catalonia should be not be seen as a potential crisis for Europe, but rather as a democratic opportunity for all nations. Let it act as a reassertion of that democracy matters more than the borders and that political conflicts are resolved with votes, not violence, always using our words and our weapon and never weapons to stifle our words. We will keep fighting until we reach victory because we know 
that we have right on our side of the legitimation of the popular will of the majority of the Catalans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, bringing your remarks to a conclusion, but more importantly, for what you were telling us when you were making your address. Uh, I'm in the hands of members now. I'm looking at the chat box at this moment in time. I have no requests uh, from members, but I'm sure they're about to come. Uh, by the way, could I ask that uh, Mr. Donnelly be recorded as now in attendance? And the first speaker wishing to speak is Councillor Paul Gallagher. Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Solidarity to one who is in exile. Uh, Charles, I, I was one, was very privileged to be in Catalonia in October 17. I spent quite a few days there and I was very uh, overwhelmed, I can say, by not only the hospitality, but also by the great sense of willingness of the people and the willingness of the people and the dem democratic process. I was there as an observer and I was there to see that if I could learn some models around the right building that I could take back to Ireland. And I very much witnessed from the participation of the entire community, from children, women, small shopkeepers, to the large corporations. I've witnessed students having a powerful impact. I, I witnessed various political parties that all got behind one banner and the one banner was around independence. The one banner was around peaceful means. And I would just like to congratulate you and say that we as Irish people have got great solidarity we have seen a lot of parallels and we've seen and we are processing and adopting a lot of the models that you have undertaken and i think that the models you've undertaken has got and has brought great benefits to this country so um, i would just like to say i hope that your position can be resolved very shortly I hope that we, as a, as a corporate body, can again further our corporate position and put pressure on European government and the UK government to uh, address many, many issues that are happening in Catalonia. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Councillor Gallagher. There were no questions in that, so I'm moving straight to Councillor Duffy, followed by Councillor Harkin. Sandra, over to you. Thank you, Chair, and gracias, and you are very welcome, um, Carlos. It's an absolute honour to have you address us here today. And on behalf of Sinn Féin, I would like to welcome you to um, our virtual meeting here. Um, Sinn Féin have always been supportive of the Catalonian people and their right to um, national de self-determination. Your presentation today um, gave a stark reality as to the treatment of your people. Um, my own party colleague, um, Martina Anderson, when she was an, an MEP, she provided international solidarity and was in Barcelona on the day of the election as well as an international observer. So we, we have that, that in common with, with Paul as well. We do 100% understand the struggle that um, the Catalonian people are going through at the minute. It is our struggle as well. And we, we have international solidarity with, with yourselves. Um, we also support the release of all political prisoners and we have also um, and will continue to call on the Spanish government to end the repression and the criminalisation of all those who support independence. 
Um, and we have also called on the Spanish government to enter inclusive dialogue with the democratically elected representatives of the Catalonian people. And we reiterate that call today. Um, just in terms of the last um, line in, in your presentation, in terms of that feeling of being right, I want to re reiterate the words of Bobby Sands because it, ju it just struck me, the similarities of struggle. And, you know, Bobby Sands' words were, it's that undauntable thought, my friend, the thought that says I'm right. So, Carlos, you're very welcome and long live international solidarity. Uh, again, I, I didn't hear any questions in Councillor Duffy's remarks, so I move to Councillor Harkin, who will be followed by uh, Councillor Riley. Uh, Sean? Thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, again, uh, like everyone else, uh, sorry. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in. And like everybody else, I would like to welcome Carles to uh, Derry and to Ireland. Unfortunately, it is through uh, virtual means. And uh, we were very excited about Carlos Carles's visit, uh, planned visit to Derry last May. But unfortunately, that had to be uh, postponed because of the pandemic uh, that we're dealing with in this island and I'm sure right across Catalonia as well. Um, my colleague, uh, Eamon McCann, uh, who raised this motion uh, in support of the Catalan people and the Catalan self-determination struggle, has stepped down from the council uh, due to health uh, issues, but he sends his solidarity today and he's watching um, and he will continue to campaign in solidarity with the Catalan people. Um, I thought your presentation was very enlightening today. Um, and I think that there's uh, discussions that are happening in this island that we will learn a lot uh, from your experience, uh, but also your determination uh, not to give up uh, on what is a democratic uh, aspiration that the people of Catalan have. Um, and I think uh, you spoke about the silence of the European Union, and uh, I think it is criminal that the European Union has not uh, spoken out in defence of democracy and in defence uh, of the people of Catalan and on their right to self-determination. And I think we as a council um, should call uh, on the European Parliament to reverse its decision to remove your immunity uh, as they voted in uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think that this uh, is a, sends a signal to the Spanish authorities that the European Parliament, the European Union, is okay with the terrible repression that is being dished out uh, to people who support um, the right of self-determination. It is about criminalizing the Catalan people. And I think we have to send a loud, loud message to everyone uh, that we here in Derry and Straban across our district, across Ireland, will not stand and watch this silently, that we will speak up and speak out in support uh, of the Catalan people. Uh, and like other speakers, uh, we have called for the uh, end by the Spanish authorities of the attempt to criminalize the democratic movement uh, and democratic demand for self-determination. We call for the prison sentences that have been uh, dished out to political leaders like yourself, Carles, and to um, many other activists to be overturned. Um, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are many hundreds of people, as you said, that the, the Spanish state is still trying to convict for the basic uh, right of uh, acting in their uh, democratic and peaceful wish uh, to see uh, a new Catalan, uh, a new Catalonia. Uh, and I also want to say that uh, we, we as a council should stand in solidarity with Pablo Hassel, who has been jailed for, for words um, criticising the Spanish government, uh, a rapper. And so, you know, free, free Pablo. Uh, I think we have to speak out about everybody who is being criminalised uh, right across Catalonia. Um, and to that effect, I, I do have uh, some proposals. I can't make them myself because I'm not a member of this committee, but I, but I hope that another member of the committee will take them up. And if they don't, uh, we will also have the opportunity to discuss these proposals at our next full council meeting. 
uh, because we have a very good motion, but we can obviously add to that and reaffirm uh, our commitment to your struggle. And so thank you again for joining us here today. Uh, we are delighted and, and uh, I think that, that uh, uh, you know, it, it, this is a historic moment. Unfortunately, it's done through uh, a virtual means, uh, but someday we will uh, hopefully be able to invite you here in person. So thank you again. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Harkin. I, I note that uh, Councillor Gallagher has a proposal in the chat box. I, I'm not taking that proposal at the moment. Paul, I'm uh, concentrating on contributions towards Carlos from from members, and I trust you will understand and appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Riley is next, followed by Councillor uh, Alderman McCready. So, uh, Martin. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and like other uh, speakers before me, can I also uh, give a very warm virtual Cade Mila Falsia to Carlos and uh, and welcome you here to our virtual chamber this afternoon. Uh, as you know, this came out of a motion that was passed uh, in the in the guild hall when we thought that a physical visit would be uh, the the norm. So uh, it it's. Uh, it's obviously disappointing that it it has taken this long uh, with the pandemic to, to to get this set up today. But uh, we we thank you for your time and, and for coming to speak to us this afternoon. Um, like, like others have said, uh, you know the, the the struggle for independence in, in Catalonia has been ongoing now for uh, you know for for so long. It 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 draws parallels certainly with uh, what is happening on our own island, uh, and that's why it's useful certainly in your. In your statement, and thank you for circulating your address to us this afternoon in advance for us to peruse. Um, but certainly for us uh, in the SDLP, uh, it was great to see uh, on page three in the paragraph where you talk about uh, clearly stating that at no time has anybody digressed even a millimetre uh, to quote your statement uh, in relation to the the two principles uh, of uh, of peaceful democratic means. Uh, because for our party, that's always been what. Uh, you know where we in our party in the SDLP ha ha have been at in relation to campaigning for um, in our our own entitlements to pursue an uh, an agenda of the unification of our island. Because uh, as as John Hume has said, when people are divided, agreement is the only solution, uh, and agreement can only be reached uh, if people are acting in a peaceful and democratic way. Uh, that is the is the is the foundation of the civil rights movement. That that. That happened here in in our city, uh, and through the decades of uh, of violence, our party always made clear that that peaceful democratic means was the way to progress things. So it was the, with that in mind that that uh, our, our city and our council uh, looked on uh, with deep and grave concern at the violence that took place in your country uh, in 2017 when there was uh, when there was peaceful protests that were being uh, been protesters were being heavily handled by police officers uh, people were being uh, arrested uh, and obviously people were being uh, put into prison and in, in, into exile uh, so w w we have no issue with uh, people uh, urging us to write to uh, the EU and others in relation to standing against that type of um, of violence. I, I see there's a number of proposals that are going into the chat box as I've been speaking, so I, I haven't had a chance to look at those. I haven't had any prior notice of them, Chair, so I'll not speak to any of the proposals right now, um, but just to add our words of welcome to uh, Carlos for coming along this afternoon. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Riley. Uh, again, uh, Carlos, there's actually no questions here at the moment. Uh, you're sitting there smiling, perhaps quite uh, content with the uh, uh, support being generated throughout the chamber at this moment. Uh, can I move to Alderman McCready next, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and gracias, Senior Carlos, uh, for your presence here today and indeed your presentation. Uh, which was uh, insightful, uh, and um, we take it all on board. It's quite, uh, it makes a quite uncomfortable listening uh, when you hear it from yourself. And I'd just like to say on behalf of the Democratic Unionist Party uh, that you're very welcome here. I wish that it could be in better circumstances where you'd be physically here, as the city and district is offers so much and is very beautiful. And you'll be very welcome here anytime in the future uh, when it's safe to be so. 
And uh, I, I certainly, and we do support your uh, right to freedom of speech, to a right to freedom of protest, and you know that self determination within a democratic process. Absolutely. And if there's a few things that we can share and take away is how we got wrong in our country from all angles, all parties and all stakeholders. And I suppose anecdotally here, or even within this chamber, we are divided. Um, I call the city Londonderry. Other people call it Derry, but we're not compelling each other to call it one or the other. Um, there's that freedom of speech. And albeit I'm in a minority, I still have that freedom to express myself, represent my constituents, and to be part of Northern Ireland in the United Kingdom for all our self-determination. And Carlos, the, the lesson I certainly would take away is, is do not get it wrong like we did uh, by going down the most uh, brittle and violent past in the last kind of 40 years uh, in our very small country. You know, over three and a half thousand people uh, were brutally murdered and killed in all so, uh, sorts of circumstances. And you're at that point at the very beginning where it can go horribly wrong or inc incredibly great. And I really just urge you that when you go back or when you speak with uh, your people, your your fellow politicians and those who are, are on point in this protest is stick strong and, and do not let any elements of that dissident element from any faction or any wing, left or right, to get involved in your struggle. Please, I beg you to keep it peaceful as best you can. Um, because the alternative, when you look back in our history, it is absolutely incomprehensible and regrettable at all counts. Um, I'll wait out for the proposals. Uh, but, Senior Carlos, gracias. I thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, Alderman McCready. Uh, just while uh, Ryan was, was talking there, Carlos, uh, I think the, the thing that flashed into my mind uh, was the actions of the fire uh, firemen in Catalan at the time when people were under pressure. And uh, I think that actually said a hell of a lot uh, to many people. Uh, Councillor Donnelly, uh, you're on the next, uh, list next. Thank you, Chair, and give me the fault, Carlos, and gracias for your, your presentation. Uh, apologies, I, I was uh, uh, probably about two or three minutes late, so I'm looking forward to reading uh, a copy of it. Uh, look, I want to send solidarity with your cause, and uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a long struggle. There's been a lot of talk here about violence. You know, the only violence that I've seen there is state violence. And there's a lot of similarities with Ireland. Uh, you know, when people talk about democracy, it's the denial of national democracy in Ireland, which has caused the problems here. The, you know, uh, when, when people, are, you know, if the state uses the same attitudes uh, in your country that it has used here for, for centuries, you know, the, it, it's, it's possibly inevitable that that will turn to some type of resistance. You know, and I think if people want to prevent that type of violence, what they need to be doing is putting pressure on the Spanish government and, 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 and make sure that they uh, allow for, you know, national self-determination. But, you know, democracy, we, we've seen what, what the great and the good do when they don't like the results of democracy. We've seen it here in Ireland when we've had our country partitioned and all that has uh, emanated from that. We're now down to, you know, possibly a border poll that has British legislative control at all stages. We've already seen in Scotland, you know, they're now planning to rush bills through Westminster where they're changing the, you know, the percentages, how, many, how much of a turnout there has to be. And of that turnout, there needs to be 65. You know, they're, they're, they're changing the goalposts. The Spanish government will do the same. We've seen what happened when they didn't like democracy in, pa in Palestine or Cuba and Venezuela. You know, so I think when we, we're looking to put pressure on, then what we need to do is put it on the Spanish uh, government. We have two states here in Ireland. Both of them are, have puppet parliaments. One's ruled from Brussels and one's ruled from Westminster. You know, uh, uh, and I don't need to tell you how, how conniving that, uh, you know, these these uh, imperialist governments can be. But my question is, is that uh, 
you know, and, and we still living with, we, we're living day and daily here with state uh, repression, harassment, uh, you know, they will do, the state will do whatever it has to do to keep control of its power. We have political prisoners here. But my question to you is, what can we do as elected representatives in this part of the world in order to help your cause? Thank you. Uh, thank you, members. I have nobody else uh, speaking to seeking to contribute. Uh, Carlos, you've had uh, quite a lot of input there. And eventually at the end, we've had one question. Uh, do you wish to respond to the contributors and indeed to that question? Over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your work, for your inspiring words. And thank you for your solidarity, uh, for, for your commitment to, to democratic uh, way to solve conflicts. Obviously, all you, you, can, you can do in favor of allowing the possibility to discuss, dialogue, negotiate, and finding ways to solve uh, will be very helpful to us. And all the voices are welcomed uh, across Europe. And you are a very important part for Catalan people. Your voice has a moral authority uh, for your history, for your commitment, for your fight, and for your way to solve also. Uh, solutions through democratic and peaceful means. So thank you very much. Um, I hope very soon I will be able to travel as the rest of our uh, colleagues and our citizens and uh, find you personally and express in a personal way uh, our thanks to all of you. And obviously, if um, you need something from Catalan people, uh, please come on us and uh, you, you will find also solidarity and help come from the all across Catalonia to Irish people and to all of Irish people. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me, for your inspiring words uh, to continue fighting for not only for Catalonia, but also for European democracy. Thank you, and we wish you well going forward. Uh, I would normally be saying something like safe home, <laughs> but uh, we just wish you well going forward. Uh, a quick reflection from myself. Uh, I think the, the situation that we've had uh, discussed here reference the Catalan uh, position uh, to me shows quite clearly that geographic uh, situation does not necessarily bind people together. Uh, if I think of the Iberian uh, Peninsula, uh, I suppose we, we are now looking at perhaps four entities with Portugal, Spain, Catalan, and indeed Gibraltar as part of that geographic uh, position. Uh, and I suppose if we, if we consider it on our own island, uh, you know, because of the geographics doesn't necessarily mean uh, that we have to be united. But uh, thank you very much for your uh, contribution <laughs> and to the members. Moving sure. on, uh, Councillor Gallagher. Sure. Just could, could I just uh, ask if you could stay on and hear the end of the debate? To be, to be Russian half, yes? Who? <laughs> Me? <laughs> no, the President. <laughs> Are you still there? No, I know. I thought, you were, I thought you were pushing him out. No, he's very welcome to, to stay on. You're very welcome, Carlos, to stay on for the. The, uh, the rest of our very important deliberations that we go through, remembering that this is a committee. Uh, but you're very welcome to stay there, no, no problems at all. Um, moving forward, could, could I ask that uh, Councillor Rory McHugh and Councillor John Boyle be recorded uh, as an attendance? Uh, with regard to the motions, I, I've taken advice and considering them myself. Uh, with regard to Councillor um, Gallagher's motion, uh, quite clearly that is simply an endorsement of the previous council motion, and I'm prepared to accept that motion. Uh, Councillor Harkin's suggested motion, uh, Councillor Harkin is not a member of the committee, and even if uh, another member were to propose it, uh, I'm sure members can agree that it's a very substantive motion, uh, not taking away from its worthwhileness or, or anything else. But being as of such a substantive nature, 
uh, it would be better proposed uh, through the proper channels as a motion for full council. Uh, that is my ruling on it. Uh, I'm now taking the proposal from Councillor Gallagher. It's in the chat box. Uh, Councillor Gallagher, do you want to speak to your proposal? Yes, Chair. I think, I think it's uh, when we're talking about reaffirming. I think we have to uh, be. Sorry, sorry, Paul. Uh, could I have a seconder for that before we move on? Chair, I seconded it. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Sandra. Chair, I think that, you know, and, and we made this we made this uh, proposal before, and it is the corporate position of council. But I think we have to be, uh, and what was highlighted today, we have to have a continuance of this. That we have to be proactive on this, uh, and that I think that what's well, it's, it's slightly missing from that as well. But I think we need to contact uh, everyone that is possible that can have a, an influence on this within the, the European Union. Uh, and I, I know the, the, the Brits have, have left uh, with the Brexit, but uh, they also might have some influence. Yes, we have. <laughs> I, uh, they, they might also have the, some influence, and as well as that, as the 26 county government, that we should also write to them and give them our corporate position that they also might have a voice in, in Europe to, to to lobby and to change the circumstances that's contained within the, within the motion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Paul, uh, I've noticed there that you've actually extended slightly on your motion because the motion says to write to the European Union. Uh, do you wish to amend that to include uh, your comments? Uh, yes, Chair. To include the, both the UK government and the government of the 26 counties. Right. Uh, except that, uh, Sandra, do you wish to uh, speak to the motion? Chair, yeah, can I raise a point of order, please? Uh, point of order. Uh, which particular point of order? The standing orders in front of me here? Yes. Of it's a standing orders that um, refers directly to. When a motion is passed in council, that it can't be redressed or readdressed within a, pe a set period of time. Uh, just that, period, that period is six months. Okay, and that six months has lapsed? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think it's really just a, uh, an endorsement of the previous motion, and we, Alderman McCready. Uh, sorry, Councillor Duffy, can you go ahead? I'll, I'll just be very brief. Um, I thank Councillor Gallagher for bringing the bringing the proposal again. It is a reaffirming our previous position in terms of the the Catalonian people and our support continued support for them. So happy to continue with that. Um, and anything else was also happy to propose um, the proposal that um, Councillor Harkin had in the chat box. But we'll we'll wait for full council for that one then. Thank you. Appreciate appreciate that, Councillor Duffy. Uh, Chair Paul, uh, Just before that, Paul, do you want to uh, amend that motion uh, uh, as you've suggested at the minute? It's in the chat box. It's not up on screen uh, for me. Anyway, I'm not sure about other members. Could we have the motion on on screen as with the, with the uh, UK and ROI amendment right to the European Union? Uh, United Kingdom government and the government of the Republic of Ireland. Can that be added? Where where the cursor is at the moment? Can that be added? Of the Republic of Ireland. <laughs> not, not all Ireland. <laughs> You're not there yet, Paul. <laughs> Are you content with that, Councillor Geller? Yes, Chair. Right. It's been proposed, seconded, Sandra. Spoken to by uh, Councillor Geller and Councillor Duffy. Uh, moving. Um, Councillor Donnelly, you wish to speak on the motion? Yeah, Chair. Look, I'm going to, I'm going to support this, but I have to say that given our own situation here in Ireland, 
given that the what's known what's written here is Republic of Ireland, which re actually referring to the twenty six county government, have actually dropped articles two and three, the 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 about the six counties and the fact that the UK government is a government that is denial denying national sovereignty to the people of Ireland. But I think, you know, and regards the European Union, I think, you know, they've turned a blind, blind eye to the whole process. And I think there might be, I'm not, I wonder what Councillor Gallagher considered putting in the United Nations. Not that I believe that the United Nations is a great bastion of, of uh, you know, protector of, of our, you know, small nations and that, but it might be an idea they, they put the United Nations in too. I'd like to know what, what they would think of that. Thank you. Chair, Chair I'd be happy to, that be included. Uh, can we add in uh, the Republic of Ireland and the United Nations? I'm, I'm hoping that we have now moved to the substantive motion. Are members content that that would be the substantive motion? I hear nothing to the contrary. Can I ask that not now be shown as the substantive motion? I've lost a bit. Sorry, Nola. <laughs> And we just have that finalised there, United N. Or a member's content that we, oh yeah, just there, United Nations. That's great, thanks. Uh, members, that is the motion that's been proposed, seconded, spoken to. Is there anyone else wishes to speak to the motion? I haven't heard anything contrary to the motion. And as we've already said, it's the reaffirmation of a corporate sure. position. <laughs> Sorry, who's that? Harker here. I'm in the chat box. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm away down below. Uh, Councillor Harkin. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair, uh, for letting me in and uh, fully support uh, Councillor Gallagher's motion and uh, appreciate that we were thinking on the same uh, lines. Unfortunately, he's a committee member and I, I'm not. Um, I just want to say, look, uh, you know, Carly is, is uh, the former president of um, Catalonia, uh, who made a sorry, sorry, Councillor Harkin, fully understand what you're trying to do here, but that is part of a motion that I am suggesting. Oh, you to... Sorry, Wait, sorry, 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 uh, Councillor Harkin, if you can speak directly to this motion, that's fair enough without expanding into the areas that you're expressing within your motion, which I, I'm i not saying is right or wrong. I'm simply saying uh, the protocol should be that it, it is brought to full council because it's substantive uh, moving away from uh, the particular motion that we have of re reaffirmation here. Thank well, you, uh, Chair, I'm not, I'm not speaking to my motion. I'm, I'm speaking in support of the motion in front of me. And what I was going to say is, I think the fact that we have the former president of Catalonia here, who led a historic event in organising a referendum, he should be shown respect. And I will point out to the chair that he's also an MP. Um, and uh, maybe you didn't realise that, but that's a fact. And he's been invited here by this council and the people of Ireland want to see him here. And uh, we have a mandate to do that. Uh, he was wrapped up. He shouldn't have been wrapped up. And I don't like the way that you're chairing the meeting. Uh, I think that this is unnecessary and shows a lack of respect. And the way he interrupted me uh, has only confirmed that. So full solidarity with uh, Councillor Gallagher's proposal. And this will be brought up at a later, later date. And I appreciate that Councillor Duffy was willing to move forward.
the motion as well. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, sorry, thank you, Councillor Harkin. Uh, I was simply following the normal protocol for presentations. Uh, we, we have to have a limitation on, on presentations, and uh, I certainly meant no uh, disrespect uh, to, to the presenter. Uh, and I'm sorry that if you feel that that was the case, Councillor Harkin, but it certainly wasn't from my, my perspective. Um, the motion is in front of you, members. Proposed second is I don't hear anything to the contrary. Therefore, I declare that motion passed. Uh, the next item. Uh, the next item of business is Chairman's business item six. Uh, I've had no requests from any members, uh, but uh, I had an item of my own, which I'm, I'm going to move on on and move straight to item seven. Uh, matters arising from the open minutes of the government strategic uh, government strategic planning committee held on the 2nd of March. If members have it in front of them. Sorry, my iPad's playing up here. Uh, pages tw uh, 1 to 20. Um, this has already been passed at council. To the best of my, yeah, it has been. Uh, so there's no accuracy. Any matters arising from those minutes, members? No matters arising. I uh, will move to item 8. And there are several declarations of interest in the uh, chat box. And I'll take those as read. The items of interest of the or declarations of interest if they can be recorded. And the Chief lead finance chair. officer. Chief Apologies. Chief chair, Apologies. Chief yes, uh, Councillor Fleming. If I could add my declaration of interest as a member okay. of the Accepted. board. Chair. I'll just go back in the chat box to that list that was in there. Uh, okay. Uh, Alderman McCready, uh, the Chief Executive. Who's AD? Alfie Dallas and Denise Smith. Al Al Alfie and Denise, okay. And now Councillor Fleming added to that. Members content moving then to the lead finance officer to take us through. Hi, right, Chair the... John Boyle here. I just put it on the chat box there. Uh, right, right, John, just picking up on that now. Thank you. Any other declarations of interest on CODA? Right, can we move forward then? for Alfie to take us through agenda item eight. Thank you. Chair, sure, if I may um, come in just ahead of Alfie, just to- That's okay, yep. If that's okay with your indulgence. No problem. Uh, thank you, Chair. Members, it's um, it's obviously been a very challenging year, uh, well, for all of us, but um, also for the airport, um, and it continues to be so. Um, however, due to, as, as you'll know from previous reports, due to exceptionally um, proactive management by um, by the quota board and those um, from council who sit on the quota board, including uh, elected representatives, um, and the, you know, the, the, the support that has been received financially, and, and particular from the executive, um, we've been able to work through the challenges of this year with no additional monies um, required for the airport um, from council other than um, its its normal recurrent commitment um, through the race estimates. And as things currently stand this year, um, members, that will hopefully also um, be the position for the incoming financial year. And obviously, as council, we've just been through another particularly challenging rates estimates process. So. Um, we are hopefully in the position, uh, due to that management and the income received from, or the finances received from government, that the next financial year should, at this stage, be covered. However, um, with a view to our obvious, obviously the wider strategic priorities of council and the financial pressures on council, and as agreed by this committee and this council um, some time ago prior to COVID. Officers and members of the CODA board have been working on a detailed proposition to governments uh, to partner with council 
and sustaining the airport financially uh, in the years ahead. This work, members, is now complete, um, and Alfie is going to take us through um, his report and, and the details of the work that has been completed with regard to this future financial sustainability. Members, if this approach to government or governments is successful, it will significantly reduce the financial challenge uh, on council and the responsibility for the sustainability of the airport will become a shared sustainability between council uh, and our partners in government. Clearly, the journey ahead to reach that point will be challenging. Um, it will be it will require a lot of hard work to progress our case. But chair and members, it's actually very encouraging at this stage that even in advance of producing this report to government, that we've seen a number of positive engagements with government over the last number of months. Um, you will have heard that the UK government and the Department for the Economy have recently confirmed joint 100% um, continuation of funding for the next two years for the London PSO route. That in part fulfills some of the ask in the in the business case that has been presented to you today. Um, as I said earlier, the Northern Ireland Executive um, have provided substantial amounts of COVID funding and continue to do so. And we hope that there may be um, some further funding available to the airport as we uh, go into next year's financial year. And right now, as we speak, the Irish government uh, are presently considering the feasibility and the detail around their potential support for a potential uh, PSO route uh, to Dublin as indicated and as set out in the new decade new approach agreement. It's also very encouraging to note uh, members that further to Ryanair recently notifying that is that it is at least temporarily withdrawing services to Liverpool and to Edinburgh, that Loganair have, have straight away stepped in and are both picking up the Liverpool route and also substantially increasing frequency on the Glasgow route. So Chair, um, through you, I'm going to pass over to Alfie uh, to take us through the report, following what um, we as officers and board members, and indeed, uh, I think we've been joined by the manager of the airport, Steve Fraser, and the chair of the board, uh, Albert Harrison, um, stand ready to, um, to address any comments or ask any questions that members may have. So over to yourself, Alfie, through you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chief Executive. And uh, members will hold everything until after Alfie's presentation. Alfie, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, members, the report is for you to improve, approve that engagement is now urgently commenced with the government on the basis of the very detailed outline business case that's been prepared. Um, John has touched on a lot of the background, so you'll be aware that we're pursuing the medium term strategy whereby government would contribute towards the cost of the airport on a more shared basis with council. And that's really to ensure that the critical connectivity that the airport provides can continue. And I suppose that's also in the con context of the wider um, transport infrastructure challenges that we face in the Northwest. Um, you'll be aware, members, that we currently subvent um, an excess of 3.4 million per annum, um, both capital and operating subvention, a significant challenge, obviously, for a small Northern Ireland Council with the very other significant funding priorities that we have. Um, positively, alongside that, members, um, you'll be aware that we receive 100% support from government um, towards the London PSO to Stansted at a cost of over two million per annum. And that cost is shared between the NI and UK governments and has just now recently been confirmed up until March 23. And also, as John has said, during this year in particular, um, the 2021 year, um, we've received almost two and a half million of support, mainly towards operating subvention costs during the pandemic. And those savings that um, Council will realise as a result of that has provided us with some interim funds that will ensure sustainability in the 21-22, whilst these critical medium-term discussions are progressed. And essentially, members, the medium-term discuss discussions are focused on two key principles. Um, firstly, contributions from government are required towards the ongoing revenue costs, which will allow co Council's contribution to reduce and these funds to be made available for other um, strategic priorities. 
and secondly that the continued RIP development support from government um, continues, critically the London PSO but other but also any other opportunities that are available and also crucially that those are extended for a time frame beyond 2023 to give medium term planning certainty to the airport. So members to progress these discussions as you're aware any government commitment will require a very detailed outline business case to be prepared and um, that work has now completed a significant amount of work and it has also been supported by a very invaluable independent expert analysis around the options and economic impacts so really just picking out members in this report the what i see is the five key areas of focus within the detailed obc um, area one is the aim of the obc it's very clear that we seek to secure a rebalancing between council and the government of the financial responsibility for funding the OPEX and CAPEX requirements of CODA um, to allow the key infrastructural asset to continue providing us with critical air connectivity. Secondly, members, the strategic context, I think that's very strong in the business case. We clearly deliver on a significant range of priorities outlined in relevant regional and national government strategies um, in terms of economic growth and strategic alignment with regional and economic policy. Um, those are all set out in detail, members, in section 3.3 um, of the report. Um, thirdly, members, and I suppose this is the critical element of the business case, why is government support needed? And again, um, there's a very long list of reasons why we feel that is the case, and those are set out in section 3.4 of the report, and I'll just maybe pick out what I see as the key ones. Obviously, the airport provides critical connectivity for over 200,000 passengers each year across a range of destinations in the UK, including the critical connection to London, as well as the recently announced summer service um, to Pama. The economic impact members that has been um, now updated by an independent economic assessment and interestingly members that shows the total direct and direct impact of the airport both operationally as well as the wider catalytic impact and that relates relates to business productivity and tourism in 2019 members that figure equated to 26 million additional gva per annum and 850 jobs and obviously that's a very significant figure in comparison to the overall cost um other couple of important points members uh, eu state aid regulations are very are recognized widely that smaller airports require public support to survive and i think the figure is quoted as airports with under a million passengers will require public support to sur survive and closely linked to that there's very significant support provided in other jurisdictions to regional airports such as scotland wales and ireland as well as across europe um, the level of subvention provided by council as i've touched on is about 5.4 percent of our overall rates and members moving forward the reality is that would need to increase so therefore the need for government intervention at this point is, is, is critical and a range of other points made there, members, in terms of the importance of aviation moving forward and addressing the challenges we face as a region, such as peripherality, infrastructure deficit, deprivation, unemployment, as well as um, economic growth, um, such as foreign direct investment, exports and tourism. So members, any business case has to look at a number of options and with a view to identifying a prepared way forward and based on that informed analysis that I've spoken about and the independent advice and um, the options examined within the case um, basically were in three categories. Number one, returning to that baseline connectivity before COVID of circa 200k passengers per annum. Um, secondly, a number of growth options were explored, ranging from very modest growth to high growth. Um, those included more flexible approaches to using PSO aircraft or um, through other growth options, such as a potential new Dublin PSO rate as, envis as envisaged in the new decade new approach agreement. And as in any business case, members were required to evaluate the, the do nothing or the closure option. And obviously that has identified a very significant financial outlay that would be required and a very significant wider economic impact if that were to be the case. And therefore it's not obviously the recommended option within the proposal. 
So also in each of the evaluated options, members, we looked at the feasibility of capital support um, to fund the MRO hangar development proposal. And again, it's clear that would provide very significant additional jobs and benefits, but obviously would require a significant further contribution from government to make it feasible. So having looked at all those options, members um, getting to the conclusion and the proposed way forward, um, I think it's obviously important to consider those in the light of the risks and feasibility of each option. It would be ideal for the, the, the a massive increase, a massive growth option. However, um, we also have to take into account what's achievable and the risks associated with each option. So the recommendation within the case is that um, initially a return to the pre-COVID activity levels of circa 200k passengers per annum, that that could only be achieved through a rebalancing of that financial, op financial responsibility um, between council and government. Um, as well as continued um, government support for the PSO. And it also says that growth beyond this can clearly be achieved through the, the Derry Dublin PSO as envisaged in the NDNA agreement. That's one thing, members, there was a lot of stakeholder engagement done through this process where um, there was significant local demand identified for that route. So, members, um, to conclude, um, the business case ba basically recommends a three stranded approach. Um, and it's important just to state what those three strands are. Strand one, a £15 million funding pack package from government over a six year period that represents £2.5 million per annum towards the operating costs of the airport. That would see Council's contribution reduced to 1.5 million per annum, as opposed to the current 3.4 million per annum, and releasing funds for investment in other critical priorities and pressures. Strand two is that the London PSO service, which is currently contracted for two more years, is continued to be 100% funded beyond that date over the same duration as the business case. And strand three, that discussions through the North South Ministerial Council are advanced in relation to the Dublin uh, PSO uh, potential um, development. So on the basis of that approach, members, um, it is recommended that you, you approve that engagement is now urgently commenced with government um, and um, to secure the funding support required from government to ensure the continued sustainability of the airport. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Alfred. Um, the first person I have seeking to come in is uh, Councillor Fleming. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thanks, Derek. And uh, could I also, this is already declared an interest, a non pecuniary interest. Uh, and could I welcome uh, the Chair of the Airport Board, Albert Harrison, and uh, the Manager, Steve Fraser? You're both very welcome. And as I say, a, a member of the Board and, and have seen the, the work that has been done to this report, both by those at the, the airport and council officers, and then obviously the outside agencies that helped with uh, bringing putting this report together. I, I mean, from, from Sinn Féin's point of view, we uh, support the recommendation uh, for many of the reasons outlined, and also against the backdrop of uh, people fighting to retain uh, uh, a very important piece of infrastructure here in the Northwest, which serves not only Derry and Stavon District Council, but also Donegal, who in terms of 40% of passengers f from there. And it is, it is timely and it is of essence that, that we move forward in terms of going to a number of seats of governance uh, in terms to uh, alongside our own commitment to the airport to also show their commitment to, as I say, an important piece of infrastructure that does bring economic uh, development and in terms of tourism. And as we know, there are many people from this uh, northwest area who travel to different destinations in terms of university and all that that, that entails, as well as the wider uh, tourism perspective. The figures, uh, in many ways, are there. We we have, uh, in, in many ways, 
uh, question than before in terms of Council's uh, commitment and how much Council put into this. This is also an opportunity to actually uh, see all our governance arrangements and all our government funding, which will uh, allow us to reduce our subvention and obviously in terms of the money saved, have the option to put it into our own capital development projects as loan charges uh, and also in terms of a wider council services. So in terms of moving forward with this, uh, Sinn Féin will be supportive of this here and hope to see uh, certainty and growth, obviously getting back after the pandemic and also the security uh, and peace of mind of those who have tirelessly worked in the airport over many years. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Fleming. Again, uh, moving on to Councillor Boyle, John Boyle. Thank you, Chair. Um, and similar to um, Councillor Fleming, obviously, I have uh, also declared a non pecuniary um, interest uh, as a member of the uh, board of uh, City of Derry Airport, albeit clearly representing uh, the council's interests. And, uh, Chair, I'm not sure if, if, if Councillor Fleming was uh, proposing that we endorse this particular approach. If he is, of course, I'm content to second his proposal um, uh, because on behalf of the SDLP, I also want to mm. uh, yes. that, that we do endorse and support. No, um, well, we haven't done anything. The input here, Chair. Uh, Sandra might want to knock off her microphone there, Chair, I think. Yeah, I was just going to remind Sandra there. Thank you, Sandra. But just to start, <laughs> just, to, just to start, uh, Chair, again, um, to, to welcome uh, Albert Harrison and Steve Fraser, um, the, the, chair and the Chair and Manager, respectively, um, of City of Derry Airport. I know um, the level of time, uh, effort and commitment that uh, they and their team at the airport have put into uh, building up and preparing the business case that will be going forward. Um, and I mean, it's, it's important to reflect on a couple of matters. Uh, uh, the, particularly the confirmation from the uh, York Aviation Report, which confirms uh, the impact uh, that the airport makes uh, regionally. Um, uh, it's, it's not an insubstantial amount. Um, uh, a GBA of 26 million in 2019, you would expect that to grow um, directly and indirectly, obviously, then supporting 850 jobs. Uh, again, clearly not to be sniffed at. And in my view, uh, when you look at the level of investment, whether it comes from this council alone or indeed uh, as part of the proposal going in front of us, um, that would represent very significant value for money um, uh, going forward. But I mean, it has to be viewed here um, that uh, the report as prepared, the business case as repaired, is really looking at uh, a shared sustainability. And indeed, I view this very much as a proposition which would be a partnership uh, going into uh, the medium to, to long term. Um, uh, I mean, let's face it, uh, there already exists um, in other jurisdictions, as already pointed out by Alfie, uh, extensive funding support, uh, which is provided by uh, regional government, particularly in Scotland, particularly in Wales, and even national government level in the Republic of Ireland. Why should we be any different, um, uh, given uh, our peripherality uh, and the challenges that we face here that have been very well rehearsed over um, uh, the, the, the last while, and again referenced there by Councillor Fleming as well. Uh, so, Chair, um, the, the, the Dublin PSO would be a, a very important uh, development for us as well, and, and I look forward to uh, the negotiations around that, but it has to be remembered um, that actually forms part of new decade, new approach, um, and the Dublin government have signed up to that particular element of it, and so I would like to see that also progress. Uh, and clearly, what has been very welcome is the continued support uh, of the Department for Infrastructure, particularly through this year and the, and the challenges of COVID. Um, uh, and, that, and that has meant, obviously, then that, that, that there, there, there are extra monies that we, we can invest going forward into the next financial year, and that has to be welcome too. Um, so just to finish, Chair, um, also to, to thank um, the, the staff, all of the staff, uh, at the airport for their continued commitment uh, to uh, 
the facility um, to our customers um, who pass through it. Um, I, I know that uh, th these have been challenging times for, for, for staff across the board and the airport staff won't have been any different. Um, uh, and we should recognise the importance of this facility in, uh, and, 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 and their future and the futures of their families as well. Uh, they have our, uh, certainly our, our wholehearted and full support. But again, Chair, uh, if Councillor Fleming was proposing, um, then I, I see he's put it in the chat box that he is proposing. So, Chair, I, uh, I will uh, second the proposal from Councillor Fleming that we adopt this particular approach um, and uh, clearly mandate officers to uh, work as suggested in the paper. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Boyle. Uh, I'm just checking here with a declaration of interest whether it's appropriate for uh, that proposal to come from someone with a declaration of interest as opposed to somebody else on the committee. Could you clarify that, Chief Executive? Sure, sure that's fine because it's not the pecuniary interest and the, um, the member is actually representing council's interest on that board. That's fine. Appreciate, appreciate that, uh, Chief Executive. It's proposed and seconded then, members, but I'm carrying on with contributions and moving to Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Chair. I, and my views are well rehearsed in this, and it sort of it, it doesn't give me much confidence when when it takes the two board members uh, to come out and propose and second this. But we'll see where that goes, Chair. Economic modelling. And, and business case, and, and I mean this with the, with the greatest respect to the people putting this together, because I know Alfie I, does, a, does a lot of hard work on it, and it's, it's, it's a case of, there's no saying, you know, a silk person, so he's here, and it's, it's a very difficult position to be. But the reality is, if, if there was an economic model for this airport, we would have had it a long time ago, a long, long time ago. The reality is the economic model is subvention and, and that's what we have and that's what we continue to have. We're here and we continue to hear over the past year about government coming in with money for this airport. But the reality is it, has, it doesn't make any impact on the rate pair. This year, rate was struck and it's still costing us three and a half million pounds. So when, when we talk about money coming in, money coming in from government, it's, we need to be talking about how it makes an impact on our repairs. When when I hear a previous councillor saying there, 40% of the users come from Donegal. So if we break that down, 40%, and that leaves 60%. And if we half that saying 30% come from Cosby, Ghost and Glens, and 30% from us, 30% of users from this council is paying 100% of the rates for this airport. That's when you look at economically, that's the reality. When we talk about to be, become subvention free, we talk about a million passengers at the height at the height of this airport, we never had nowhere near a million passengers. We didn't have a half a million passengers. And year on year on year, we have seen a constant decline in passengers. And we're now at 200,000. 200,000 equates to 20% of that million. We need to increase passenger travel by 80% to become subvention free. That's the reality, and I don't see nothing in this e economic proposal that's going to bring us to that. Now, I welcome the fact that anything that we we'll get from government that will ease the burden on the repair has to be welcomed. That's without a shadow of a doubt. But when I see this laid out like this, and I see talking of 15 million from government, I, I don't see any risks get involved with that. There's a lot of ifs, maybe, mates, and as we previously done, burn the midnight oil and it bear no fruit. So, and 
And when we talk about the risk factor, and some of it was about options and the lack of sustainability, we didn't go into in very much detail on that in this proposal. Where's the detail? What would it cost? They wrap this up. So I'd see if we were getting provided options of where we were going and a, a detailed business case. We'd need to see the fine detail on that. When Councillor Boyle talks about the GVA, I'd like to see more detail on that. How did it come to 26 million? We heard previous figures on GVA. The DEPRO was bringing in 15 million. Yet the passenger numbers year on year on year have declined. Yet the GVA has gone up. That's that's an anomaly for me. So I'm not sure where, where it's at. But in regards to the way forward, the repair cannot be continuously bailing out this airport. And the economic model cannot be revert back to Derry City and Straban repairs paying for this airport. It can't be. And we need to we need to reshake, completely reshake what this model is going to look like. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Geller. At the moment, I have two more speakers, and I intend to take those speakers and then uh, bring the contributors in for any uh, comment on on what we have. Plus, reminding we have also a proposal and seconding that the recommendation be accepted. Uh, Councillor Doyle, Emmett Doyle, my apologies to you. I missed you there earlier on, Emmett. Over to you. You're all right, Chair. Thanks for letting me in. I'm not a member of the committee. I um, appreciate as always, the work of Alfie um, and his team and John's team. Um, this, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I'm not um, unsympathetic to the points that Councillor Gallagher has made. Um, I would much rather see this money go into capital projects that are of a direct benefit to our constituents. Um, and as a party, we're um, much more in favour of ensuring that we have a balanced infrastructure strategy across regions. Um, that having been said, um, looking at the report, the one thing that that does jump out at me that that I've missed from the airport of uh, of Long is those, I suppose, non-carrier uh, interventions. With regards, I know that there's an MRO, MRO hangar that's proposed as part of this, although that again is based on um, subvention, um, which I don't think is a viable strategy going forward. But I mean, there are opportunities for this airport to become less of a burden to ratepayers. Um, and, you know, I remember raising many years ago um, about the proposal around freight, um, and even on a smaller scale. I know at that time, what was then the Derry City Council um, Airport Committee had, had done some work around that, and there was issues with regards to the, the airport runway in terms of international standards for freight. Um, uh, and haulage, but I do think that we, we need to be um, innovative. We need to be able to adapt to the fact that there is a sizable freight corridor um, from the mainland, um, uh, from uh, Britain to uh, Derrick East East Mountain there, uh, but it was slip on my side, um, to uh, Belfast. Um, but then it actually, we, we rely then on all of the infrastructure from Belfast uh, to actually get goods uh, to come here, whether in small or in large um, freight uh, infrastructure. We we should be doing that ourselves. We should be becoming uh, more self-sufficient in, in relation to um, freight. Um, and I'd like to hear what plans the airport has to do that, because I see in the business case that the MRO hangar is there, for example, um, but only on the basis of, of a subvention. Um, and I do think that we need to be more innovative around how we're going to to continue to sell a subvention to ratepayers, um, because at the moment it's very difficult. Um, I, I, do, um, I don't look on the GVA statistics with suspicion, but I, I do look at them with surprise because I don't think if you put me in a room of 100 people, make a pick out six of them that have ever used the airport. Um, certainly not a lot of people I know. Um, and that's a problem because we are asking all of our ratepayers 
to put their hands in their pockets um, to to cement at the airport. Now, getting support from the executive and the Irish government is is one thing, um, but the fact of the matter is is that we are taking um, a, a decision to deprive our ratepayers of uh, upwards of three million um, that we could be using for other projects that we desperately need um, instead of uh, submitting the airport. So, I mean, th that is where my focus lies. How are we going to make this facility um, much more self-sufficient? Because at the moment, subvention is not an option in the long term. And I know that there, you know, I understand entirely uh, Councillor Gallagher's position and he's been consistent on it, to be fair to him. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's hard not to look at the the argument of, of uh, Councillor Gallagher and ask what is the alternative, because it seems that there are many people who are very unwilling to, to look at the alternative, but certainly it, it's going to come to a point um, where the airport is going to become a burden that we are no longer prepared uh, to subvent. Um, so appreciate you again, Chair uh, Lyon Mayon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, final member seeking in is Alderman Grady Ryan. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I accept the recommendation and certainly would give my approval as a member of this committee on the business case. Um, I would like to challenge some of the comments made uh, by Member Gallagher uh, or any other member who would oppose a reduction in, in to the rate payer contribution at this stage. I would certainly urge the member to read the detailed business case, uh, which is in the confidential aspect of of the enclosures. As the detail is there, you know, independent sources, the analysis layout, uh, all within the York Aviation Report uh, on that. Uh, member Doyle's point, I have to agree, there's a, a very sub uh, substantial point there on diversification, uh, air freight innovation, and other things like that, which I would certainly welcome uh, a response from the chairman and the chief or the executive of the airport uh, within, within this forum, because I'm conscious that the free port innovation zone, free enterprise zones is on the horizon. So I'd like to get an update on that uh, for the benefit of the question that uh, member Doyle mentioned. Uh, but chair, if, if I think back, it was about a year ago that we actually sat down and talked about this in the chamber of the guild hall, uh, but it was discussed in general Similar points um, were highlighted, um, but I think you know where we highlighted the need to address the unsustainable financial subvention of kind of 5.4 percent of council's annual budget to the airport, which, as Alfie outlined, is around 3.4 million. Fundamentally, we needed a strategic, progressive way forward. And chair, I can happily say, on reading the detailed report, I can conclude that Coda have presented us with that strategic, progressive, and a sustainable way forward for the midterm. Despite the ramifications from COVID-19 pandemic, the implications associated with leaving the European Union, the airport team have delivered on what we asked for. You know, firstly, when I look at the midterm uh, funding strategy, uh, it significantly reduces the council subvention from 3.4 million to a more sustainable 1.5 million. That's to be welcomed, providing us a savings of around 1.9 million pound, close to two. Uh, so that's a, re a reduction of 3% on the rates if this went through. Uh, this is a monumental step forward. Uh, who on this committee would not welcome this reduction or them savings at this stage? Uh, I don't think you can defend that. Secondly, Chair, when I look at the quantum of the return of that 1.5 million subvention, and what do we, uh, the council, our rate pairs benefits? And I think, you know, we get a hugely significant and a positive uh, return. You know, that's economically and socially, you know, such as chair, and I'm going to list a few because some of them have been mentioned, but I think they're important to mention because they're facts. You know, some of them are true. They're historical data uh, that the airport uh, have shown, and then the assessments based off the York Aviation Report are there to be looked at. The GVA, uh, it's been snubbed once already. Uh, <laughs> it may not be exactly 26 million, but it's in the region of 26 million. It comes back into our region, you know, through it be direct or indirect related projects, tourism, business connectivity. Similarly with jobs, 850 jobs. So is that not what we want? Do we not want that? Do we not want to grow that? Um, I, I certainly want to keep that. I want to expand on that. 
I think the airport has provided us with the vehicle to do that. With the recently secured city deal funding, £250 million, we as a city and a district and as a region benefit of having an integral airport, which is ours uh, as part of our uh, you know, transportation network. And we are a city. Why should we not have one? Just because Belfast City uh, and Belfast International are two airports, uh, and somehow that people would say that, well, we shouldn't have one. Well, that's absolute nonsense. Um, we should have an airport. We're a city and we deserve one. And it is viable uh, in the long run. The, uh, Member Doyle mentioned about the, the innovation diversification. The point about free port innovation or free enterprise zones is the vehicle for that to be achieved. I think there is an aspiration there to diversify and be more um, fruitful in our thinking um, as an economic STEM leader at best for the region. It was mentioned about the new decade, new approach, the ROI and their pledge for a Dublin uh, public service obligation would be great. That needs worked on. London uh, PSO uh, continue, 100% funding, great. Chair, the list goes on extensively. I'm going to discontinue, uh, rhyming off the more positives than there are negatives for my ratepayers. I'm certainly prepared to, to answer to them. And so in summary, this is a positive, progressive and uh, a step forward. Comes at a critical time, uh, which is and the synchronicity with the aforementioned points, mainly the city deal, projects and opportunities. It's to be welcomed and championed by all who seek to enhance prosperity, opportunity, and to the betterment of our people. Lastly, I'd just like to pay credit to all those involved, Chair, because this is no easy piece of work. There's an awful lot of time, effort, and energy, and uh, I'd say patience as that has went into this. Council officers, uh, you know, Alfie in particular, Alfie's team, John Kelpie, the chairman of the board, the airports, uh, the managing director himself, and your teams. Uh, Credit to you. I think you've done an outstanding job to get what we asked for a year ago to what you've presented us today. And I think it's a very positive uh, piece of work. And I'm looking to get this going forward. Uh, and I think we should support it. Chair, thanks for your indulgence and giving me a few extra minutes there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alderman McCready. I, I'm mindful of the point that has been made. Uh, there is additional information in the confidential second section of the minutes and uh, perhaps members uh, need to reflect on that. Uh, although it's in the confidential section, you need to be aware of it as we're involved in this current discussion. Um, I've had one more request, uh, Councillor Riley, seeking to come in, Martin. Yeah, thanks Chair, and I'll, I'll be brief. Councillor Boyle from our party has, has outlined our position, so I'll, I'll not rehearse rehearse it but i just quickly thank alfie and the officers for uh, all the work they've done to uh, to get us to this stage it's following on from alderman mccready's point just in relation to free ports um and just to ask the chief executive and the other officers uh, given that we we've had a discussion in this committee about the concept of free ports in the past uh, if there's any update in relation to that and, and i think he's right uh, he being alderman mccready i think to, to reference that in this debate uh, because the airport and the port has uh, been so closely together in geography but also closely together in terms of the uh, the impact that they have for our council area in its uh, completeness across the the northwest i, I think we, we we should be thinking of those two things together as we're debating this particular uh, item on the agenda chair uh, so any update from the chief executive or other officers would be appreciated thank you councillor riley thank you i shouldn't have let you in because you must have been reading my finalization notes <laughs> With regard, and I mean you're perfectly correct. Uh, the the port, the oil port, uh, the uh, the quota, the the airport, and indeed the rail link. You know, all of those are cheek by joy and present a tremendous opportunity. Now, others in in uh, council over the years have heard me express my concerns uh, with regard to the airport. But when I look at the recommendation, I don't have a problem with the recommendation uh, because members. The recommendation is that we seek uh, funding from outside and thereby free up council funding to do exactly what some members are talking about there and what I want to see done uh, as per the last council meeting when I said we need to be, we need to be uh, taking consideration of the wider area of, of, you know, of the district council area. We need funds to do that. So if, if we can get funds from, from wherever uh, to free up the funding that we would uh, be passing on to the airport, 
so much the, uh, the better be it. Um, I have no more members wishing to come in, uh, so I'm, I'm passing to uh, the chief executive uh, wishing to come in, and I don't know if uh, Steve or, or anybody else wishes to come in on that. There. I'm concluding the discussion now, and just went, uh, um, response to the members' comments, the chief executive. Uh, thank you, Chair, for, for bringing me back in, and I'll pass in a moment to, to colleagues, uh, senior colleagues in council, and indeed Steve or Albert. Uh, just to add to uh, making some comments in response to those made by members, but I suppose uh, very briefly, just to say, um, Chair, you, you, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of the, the purpose of this report. It's it's most certainly not an argument for continuing the existing level of support, financial support by council. Um, it's quite the opposite. It's it's a proposal to substantially reduce that subvention. Um, so that can be redirected towards your other um, strategic objectives. It's it's a proposal um, to bring in three governments, the UK government, uh, the Northern Ireland government and the Republic of Ireland government in some shape or form. Uh, and it's set out clearly in the business case what that shape or form is uh, to, to um, continue the sustainability of the airport. Again, bearing in mind that we are a cross-border facility uh, serving uh, a population in, in County Donegal and indeed um, beyond. The issue of sustainability of small regional airports is probably another very long topic for discussion, but I think it's very clear that for the foreseeable future, this airport will not um, be sustainable uh, purely on financial terms. No small regional airport, as far as I'm aware, uh, anywhere in these islands or in Western Europe is. And we, I think it was raised earlier, Chair, we continue to be the only small regional airport um, that is not supported uh, by national or regional governments. Um, the situation is completely the opposite in Scotland and the Republic of Ireland. Indeed, Wales is the largest airport in Cardiff is supported by, by government and certainly the whole way down the west coast of France. Uh, Spain and other countries, national government recognises that for balanced regional development, it must support um, regional airports financially, and, and that is not left to the local authorities uh, in those areas, whether they own them or they don't, to do so. So, this is certainly a very important and testing conversation uh, to government to deliver on its commitment of balanced regional development, particularly. Um, when connectivity from the city region, um, which is a, a debate um, frequently held in, in our council chamber. Um, while significant progress has been made in some parts of it, other parts of it, and most recently last week, uh, continues to be delayed for one reason or another. Um, so connectivity uh, is vital um, as we move forward. The, um, the point about diversity in relation to the airport is a point well made by uh, Councillor Doyle and others, and, and that certainly is a key focus of the board and has been over many, many years. And I'm sure Albert and Steve will come in on this. There have been repeated attempts to diversify, uh, to attract and sustain an MRO facility on the airport, which no matter where it would go, would require a degree of subvention uh, and probably less so if it was in Coda than, than elsewhere. And of course, there are opportunities um, in freight fraught with difficulty. But there are opportunities. Um, we have undertaken, uh, and Alfie and his team have undertaken on numerous occasions, comparative analysis of the efficiency of Coda versus other regional airports of its size. And so many efficiencies have been driven over the years that we are completely assured as a board that Coda is operating at the highest level of efficiency that it possibly can, uh, given the resources uh, that are available to us. And the board is constantly focused on innovation, on new business and alternative business to, to supplement uh, commercial passenger traffic. So I'm very grateful for members' comments today. Um, we take uh, those on board and I just want to bring in um, through you, Chair, uh, other colleagues who wish to comment. I suspect Albert or Steve may, may wish to come in. Uh, who's, who's first? Okay, um, Albert, okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. 
Uh, <clears throat> first of all, Chair, uh, thanks for giving us an opportunity to speak. Um, on behalf of the board, I'd like to thank uh, the council for all the support that they've given everyone over the years, in particular those elected members who've, uh, who actually sit on the board. Uh, their support has been phenomenal. I think it's important to realise that whenever the pandemic struck um, last year, that the, the government supported two routes out of Northern Ireland uh, to ensure essential workers travelled. One was um, Belfast City to Heathrow, and the other one was from uh, Derry to Stansted. And those services were vital. <clears throat> um, a lot of nurses, doctors, um, key workers actually travelled out of um, CODA to, to the UK. If, they, if we had them in there, then they would have had to drive another couple of hours to Belfast and get onto an aircraft that was pretty f um, full without proper, I better not go into that. Anyway, the, um, so I, many thanks, much appreciated. Nothing would give me more pleasure than actually to reduce the amount of subvention that we, we get from Council to Zero. Um, we work very hard, and my thanks again to Alfie and his team and to Steve for all the effort that they've put in in producing this business plan. We looked at a numerous range of options and we've shortlisted those which you see. There is an awful lot of detail and Steve and I would be, if anybody wants to actually contact us directly and go through the document with us on a detailed basis, then more than happy to sit down and do that. It might be via Zoom, but more than happy to do it. Um, right now, I really don't want to go back into history. I'm looking forward. Uh, and I think there are more opportunities out there than, than there has ever been before. Um, we are actually having more serious conversations with more airlines than we've ever had before. There's a lot of potential good news on the, on the horizon. Airport departure tax has been um, a negative, uh, to put it mildly, for travel out of Northern Ireland. We're an island to the west of an island, the west of a continent. You know, APD has got to go, and with what looks like coming through in the unit connectivity, there's at least a 50% reduction in, in APD to £13 for domestic. Um, we are still pushing, and the three airports in Northern Ireland are working together with all the civil servants and government to see what we can to reduce APD. Um, Ryanair has stated that in the event of APD going, they would be back in force and they would be looking to actually continue more destinations across the whole of the UK. So I'm quite content that we will be able to get low cost carriers back. In terms of diversification, um, um, Emmett Boyle, is it Boyle? My apologies if I've got your name wrong, Emmett. Uh, the, um, we are looking at cargo. Uh, John and Steve have been talking about the Freeport area side of things. We also have been talking to airlines about the possibility of a maintenance facility. There is, I, I can't go into a lot of detail because it's commercially sensitive, but we already have one airline that stated that if there was a, an overhaul facility and uh, an air more MRO provider, then they would come and we would keep three lines open. So get the capital, we've got an airline and we're now looking for an MRO operator and there is a possibility of one within a period of time. So there's a lot of work going on. And in terms of routes, I think that the Dublin PSO would make a tremendous difference because that would be a first major hub for us and um, where we would hopefully a double daily to enable um, people from the Northwest to connect to uh, the world, basically. Uh, likewise, if we um, get something across the line in Manchester or somewhere else, then that also opens up golden opportunities for uh, worldwide travel for our uh, the rate pairs and everyone living in the Northwest. I could wrap it on for hours, um, but um, I'll just pass over to Steve now and see if he wants to add anything. Uh, thank you, Albert. Uh, before you go any further, you said Manchester or somewhere else. Uh, can I uh, throw Yeadon into the mix, or should I say Leeds Bradford? But that's on a personal level for football. <laughs> Moving on, Steve, over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks everyone for the comments. I would actually covered the, the vast majority of it. If I could just reiterate that, uh, yes, there is potential uh, in the freight and huge potential in the MRO hangar, both of which we are, are trying to move forward. 
I think, though, it's really important that this is the first step before any of those move forward, that uh, people need to see a secure future for this airport. Um, they need to see that it's worth investing, um, and that includes our, our council or anyone else who, who's backing us, and we need to see that um, for, for some years to come. And I, I do take on board um, Councillor Gallagher's um, comments that, yes, we unfortunately, we are a regional airport, and that does mean we, we will be under a subvention model for quite some time. Uh, and it, 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 for the majority of the next decade, um, we will need some kind of subvention. And I think it's only right that this case is put forward to uh, to move that subvention to another level. Uh, as you said, the, the percentage of people in Causeway or um, Donegal, uh, including in our own area using the airport, we need to spread. Uh, those who are getting the wider benefits, and I think it's only uh, only proper that um, the that, uh, central government will take some of that cost. Um, I think in terms of the Freeport, Northern Ireland, you know, we've got to keep an eye on it. Um, they've decided to go a very different model to, to the rest of the four nations, uh, in, i.e. we're going to get one Freeport, let's make the whole country a Freeport, and I think that's fraught with some very difficult hurdles along the way. Um, for some reason, we all meet as ports every month on this subject to try to move it forward, but um, it didn't happen last month uh, at the same point when England we're starting to announce their Freeport winners, if you like, um, and we haven't got another meeting now to the 15th of April. So I, I can't really update you in any greater detail where we are with that, but I, I personally think it's a, it's an unusual approach for Northern Ireland to, to hit the whole country with Freeport status. Um, I'm sure there's pluses and minuses and we'll only, only keep you posted, but we yes, there is huge uh, gains to be had from it, I think, uh, to answer the question. Um, Albert, I think you covered most of the other points, but I'm, I'm happy if anyone wants to come in if they feel we haven't adequately covered some of the questions. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, I'll try. Are you looking to come in or are you content? Um, I'm content, Chair. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Alfie, and, and thank you to all of the responses to members' comments. Uh, Steve, can I totally agree with you? You know, the, this notion of making the whole country. A uh, freeport to me is doesn't make sense. Anyway, uh, we are where we are. Uh, members, we have a proposal in front of us to accept the recommendation. It has been seconded. Uh, is there anyone who would be minded to vote against that? I have no indication. Therefore, I am taking it that that proposal on the recommendation is accepted and passed. Thank you, members, and thank you for the presentations. And with everyone's permission, we can move on to item nine. Uh, Alfie, are you taking that or is? Ah, you're there. <laughs> Go ahead and. Thanks very much, Chair. Um... The purpose of this report is to give you an update on the universal basic contract and also to advise you that we have now been approached by the Secretary to see if we would like to identify potential locations within our council area. Members, within the background information, you can see there that we've given you some context in terms of um, this group having been established last year, and we've got two elected representatives um, that attend the steering group. And so far, we've um, attended two meetings. Members, the first meeting really focused uh, on giving us some background information, particularly around the Scottish model and the key research that has been undertaken to date. Um, and then more recently, just in fact last week, um, the meeting focused really around the need for a feasibility study in terms of exploring a UBA model within Northern Ireland um, and what the key components would be. And it really set out the rationale for why a feasibility study was so important. And I suppose the difference between this feasibility study and that that has been undertaken within Scotland is the desire of the UBI Secretariat um, and the steering group now to focus on a peace dividend. So they're looking to look at models that um, research behavioural um, models, but also look at a UBI calculator and um, members at this stage, there's no indication of what the cost, what the final cost would be for such a piece of work um, and the UBI secretary is going to go off and do some further work in relation to that. And the other item really for key information in terms of that last steering group meeting was 
um, the fact that we've been asked to promote the UBA through our um, media channels. So um, members, if you felt um, it was appropriate, you may wish to look at the information that has already um, been promoted through their own social media platforms. Um, and um, if you felt it was appropriate to um, reinforce um, and um, retweet anything that they have um, put out in relation to their work to date. Um, members, in particular, today's report really is focusing on the idea of having trial locations. And you'll know from previous indications that um, they were looking at both Belfast City Council and also um, Derry City and Strabane District Council area. And they've indicated that there are four key criteria that they wanted to focus on in any trial that was going to come forward within Northern Ireland. Um, first and foremost, that all recipients would have to live in an urban area. Um, that they would have to be within the top 10% most deprived wards, um, and that's on the basis of the multiple deprivation measure of 2017, um, and that the trial area should represent a broad intersection of Northern Ireland Irish society. Um, and the indication from the UBA Secretariat is that that would be roughly 65%, um, 35%, that they wouldn't want anything higher than 65% for any one of community backgrounds. And finally, that um, the area should be considered to be an interface area. Um, members, just a bit further information in terms of the feasibility study itself, that as yet, they haven't, they haven't identified um, the trial location in terms of the numbers of people that could potentially um, participate. Uh, it could be 1,000, it could be 5,000, it could be 10,000. So they look at each of those models in terms of costing um, what it would be um, for the participation. Members and having reviewed this criteria um, and using it at ward level, um, there is no one area that fully meets all four criteria, and therefore we sought clarification um, to see if there's any ranking to be applied to any one of the four criteria, if all four criteria have to be fully met, and thirdly, if an area could be considered outside of a ward boundary. Um, the UBA Secretary is going to look at these um, queries and come back with some further clarification. And on that basis, members, um, it's recommended that once that um, clarification is received, that we would um, convene the Anti-Poverty Task and Finish Group and would consider the information coming forward from UBA and um, look at its application in terms of our own um, area within Derry City and Strabane District Council area, and then take back further recommendations to a Governance and Strategic Planning Committee in terms of what potential locations might be considered and would be considered to be eligible under the criteria. Members, at this stage, there's no financial equality, HR or rural needs um, issues that we'd want to report. Um, and as I say, that our recommendation is that we would take a report back to governance and strategic planning once the clarification has been received from UBA and that the members of the Anti-Poverty Task and Finish Group have had a chance to consider. And both um, elected members who are on the UBA's um, steering group are also members of this Anti-Poverty Task and Finish Group. So happy to take any questions in relation to the report, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Before Before I go to members, uh, it won't surprise uh, the Chief Executive and folk on, on this committee that I would express concern at the uh, the trial criteria, the key criteria. Uh, I think it's a mistake to have all of the uh, universal um, basic income recipients living in urban area. Uh, I can identify very quickly rural areas uh, where the rest of the criteria can be achieved. Uh, so I, I fail to understand why it, it's an urban area. Uh, we have within our own council area uh, rural areas that are in within the 10% the, the most deprived wards. Uh, they would contain an intersection uh, of, uh, of our society. And although it may not be a physical and, and, and um, interface, there are interfaces for by those that are basically a line in the sand, shall we say. Uh, so those are my initial comments on that. Uh, but uh, we are, we are. Uh, the report is in front of us. Uh, any other member wish to comment? Thanks, Gallagher. Thanks, You're welcome. Yes. Thank you, Chair. And, and a summary, uh, some of your, your previous remarks, uh, I would concur. And Chair, I'll give you an example, like I, in, in the sense of 
we have the East Ward and, and Straban, one of the most deprived areas in the north. It's got one of the highest child poverty uh, rates in the north. And going down through this criteria, you know, that would even rule them out. And I think that if the council was to fine tune all the, all the criteria that's outlined here, uh, it would have little or no benefit to uh, what it's trying to achieve. And I think that particularly people coming from the East Ward would, wouldn't be happy that they would be overlooked for such a programme based on the criteria outlined. So while it came before council and we were very supportive of the, the concept, I think that they're now slightly moving the, the goalpost by putting rigid criteria that you have to take all these boxes. I think that going back to the, the previous presentation in front of the council is that if we identified and what there should be is identified need and if we as a council identify need then we internally can choose the area that's got the identified need for this trial and we shouldn't be dictated to from on high around the very very rigid specifics that has been outlined in this report so i think that if, if, if it's not changed then the council may consider changing its position thank you chair uh thank you councillor Gallagher. councillor um do I Thank you, Chair. Um, just looking at the criteria as well, I'm, I'm a bit perplexed, to be honest. Um, whilst I represent Bally Arnott, um, my family are from the Brandywell, I, and looking at all of these these criteria, urban area, 10 most deprived wards, broad intersection and an interface area, sounds very much to me uh, like the lower end of the Mur ward. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how it doesn't meet that criteria. The, the only thing I can think of is with regards to the 10% most deprived wards, um, I, I know even if, um, you know, we, we may be looking at a ward perspective, but in terms of a super output area even, um, my understanding is that we have, I think, three out of the 10 in this city and district. Um, so one to look at, definitely, because um, it, as soon as I saw that uh, this morning, um, that was the one area that jumped out at me, obviously the intersection with the fountain community. Um, it's you know got a broad intersection because the city centre is there. There's a lot of um, temporary accommodation, ten most of private wards, and it's in an urban area. So um, be interested to see what what people think about uh, what people think about that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Doyle. Sandra, Councillor Duffy. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Look, I, I share the concerns of the previous speakers, um, but I, I think at this stage, all we're, we're proposing to do is allow the the task and finishing group to have a look at it and to, to further examine the criteria, see how it can be tweaked, if it can be tweaked. Um, because I, I, I mean, I would have to agree with um, Emmett there in terms of the Mur Ward. Uh, that was the ward that probably um, was foremost in my mind when I, when I had a look at this. But um, I, I think I'm happy enough to propose the report in terms of taking it to the task and punishing group at this point. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandra. You're proposing. Uh, I presume it's a proposal taking note of the discussion that we're currently having as well. I'm going to second it, Chair. Proposed and seconded. Uh, Councillor Farrell. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm not a member of the committee, but I'm a representative from this council uh, on the UBI steering group, and I'm obviously going to sit on the, the welfare, the anti-poverty task force that's going to make a recommendation on this. Um, I've attended both of the meetings uh, thus far in terms of the steering group, and you know, I share the concerns that, that have been detailed here. Um, what we have to understand is that we raised this at the last meeting. They were saying, oh, well, can you identify an area that meets these four criteria? But we have to understand that you know, Darian Savan is not Belfast. You know, we've got urban areas, yes, we've got lots of wards that are in the top 10% uh, most depraved. 
but when we look at interface areas and look at areas that are broad interse intersection of, of both communities, um, we're starting to struggle. And like Emmett has mentioned the fountain area, that, that's an obvious one. Uh, there, there's another two that I could think of, uh, but we need to make a decision that's that's right for this council area. And Azuna ha has mentioned in her, in her uh, report, we are waiting for feedback from the steering group uh, to see if we have to stick rigidly to this criteria. I hope the answer that comes back is no, you don't. You can do what's right uh, for your council area. Uh, so I think we have to wait until we get feedback from the steering group and then make a decision based on that feedback. I'm here, Derek. Right. Yep. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Farrell, thank you very much for that very enlightening insight. Uh, I think it clarifies uh, issues for myself, and I'm sure it does for other members, in that it is work in progress. Uh, Una, do you wish to come back? Just to thank members, uh, Chair, for all their comments, and certainly um, we will draft some papers that will look at each of the criteria in terms of how it can be applied, just one criteria at a time, because it will um, give different um, outcomes and also in terms of the super output area we can look at super output area we can look at ward level and we can also look at DEA level um, and I'm very happy to take back that in terms of the discussion and then make recommendations back to government and also to be able to make recommendations back to the steering group the UBA steering group as well so thanks very much thanks and it's been proposed and seconded members uh, and I'm um, hearing no dissension and I take it that members are agreed. The recommendation is passed. Members, I'm, I'm suggesting we take a very short break and resume at quarter past six. If members are content with that, stretch the legs. Grand, thank you. Okay, we're we're uh, resuming at six fifteen. Thank you, members.
members, it's uh, quarter past six and ready to recommence the meeting. And trusting that all are on board. And we're moving to agenda item 10. I'm not sure, Alan, are you presenting that? Yes, you, Alan. Can Chair, I ask you to, hello? Chair, John Boyle here, Chair. Um, Andrew Boyle. Just in, in light of the fact that uh, this paper, um, there's an option in this paper in relation to members of the planning committee, Chair, I would like to remove myself from uh, this particular decision uh, and declaring an interest in relation to that because this would clearly be a pecuniary interest for members of the planning committee. Uh, how many more members of the planning committee have we? Just Sandra, you? Councillor Geller. Councillor Geller, Councillor Boyle, Councillor Bresland. Sandra, are you? No, planning? no, I was just a Okay, okay. Speak. No problem. The chair. Uh, that's three. The chair. The chair yes, would be Councillor Boyle. Go, would it be necessary for us to go into the waiting room? Yeah, yeah. I'll ask the host to arrange that. Thank you. Uh, can the host arrange for Councillor Boyle, Bresland? Just checking here. Councillor Gallagher as well uh, to be removed to the lobby. Any other member? None declaring content to go ahead. Uh, Ellen, can you present the paper, please? Thank you. Yes, um, through you, Chair. Um, this report provides information to members on an amendment to the guidance on councillors' allowances, which was issued by the Department for Communities earlier this month. And it also seeks members' approval for an updated scheme of allowances, which is set out in Appendix 2. Uh, the report notes that there was a change to the scheme in, in 2019 as a result of the rescheduling of assurance audit and risk committees. And indeed, at that time, there was uh, a recommendation that the resultant um, savings in terms of the chair and vice chair allowances be reallocated to members of the planning committee. Um, it's further noted that um, we weren't able to implement that particular recommendation um, as discretion was not given by the Department for Communities to exceed their maximum of 50% of members receiving a special responsibility allowance. Having engaged with um, um, DFC further on this, uh, members, uh, I just wanted to advise that officers are now of the view that the department is not likely to change its position on that particular issue. Um, and therefore, we don't see, as, as I say, a, um, a way in the scheme at the minute to um, actually sort of pay those surplus allowances, and in which case, which amount to about 6,000. So as I say, in terms of, of the, the most recent circular, which was issued, um, it effectively increases the basic allowances for members the special responsibility allowance and also a responsibility, uh, an increase in the dependents carers allowance uh, from the 1st of April. Um, the, again, as I say, but note that in terms of the non-payment of the special responsibility allowance, which arose out of the um, reduction in that payable to a, a chair and uh, obviously the vice chair, that's an under allocation then approximately of six thousand pound over a financial year in terms of the total responsibility or special responsibility allowance that can be paid. Um, the report there highlights that that uh, is currently reflected in the draft scheme is at appendix two. Um, the recommendation in front of members this afternoon is that subject to members' counts, uh, comments, the updated scheme is set out in Appendix 2 is adopted and that direction is provided by members in respect of the future treatment of the unallocated special responsibility allowance. Um, the paper itself identifies three potential options which are not 
you know, sort of the um, exclusive and members may wish to sort of take a further uh, or additional um, direction in that particular issue. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ellen. Um, all right. Uh, I've just noticed here that uh, Councillor Mooney, uh, a member of the Planning Committee, was having difficulties actually declaring that uh, through or, through the virtual nature of the meeting. Uh, he has removed himself from the meeting, uh, but if uh, Councillor Reddy can contact him, if he contacts the host and wishes to be uh, placed in the lobby in, in the meantime, or he's content just out himself, uh, that's grand by me. At the moment, I have two lists on the list for uh, addressing this matter. Councillor Duffy, Sandra. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ellen, for the report. Um, Ellen, I do really appreciate the report, but I am going to make a recommendation. I would recommend that we reject um, 5.1, and in terms of 5.2, I would recommend that we go with the third option of developing an approach to allocate the allowance to the members of the planning committee. Um, I think that that was the decision that we took in terms of the special um, responsibility allowance, that it was in relation to the planning committee and their additional workload. So I think that that, that option should be explored for that. But in terms of um, 5.1 and the scheme of allowances for everybody, it's just in terms of the current um, economic climate and the struggles that um, our citizens are going through. We have sat at meetings and we have talked about food banks and we have talked about our hardship funds and you know so on and so on. And we have a poverty task group. It just feels wrong at this current time and this current climate for us to be sitting and awarding ourselves um, and increasing our allowances. So that's my rationale in terms of, of 5.1. Um, so that's my proposal that we we don't adopt that at this time, and then for five point two we go for the third option in terms of the planning committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. Uh, just for clarity, can you put that into the chat box? Uh, it, it is proposed, not seconded at the moment, but I'm, I'm sure there will be a second as we move forward. Uh, Alderman McCready. Thank you, Chair. Um, Pending it coming on the screen, but I'm inclined to agree with Member Duffy. I think uh, we should reject it, but only reject the 5.1. Um, I want to separate. So when we put the recommendations forward, is it feasible to um, do one at a time? Because I think I, I need I further discussions and debate around the 5.2 and other options on the on allocation of the six thousand pound. Uh, is that feasible before I continue, Chair? Uh, I'm certainly amenable to taking each of the recommendations uh, um, at one at a time, but I'm uh, waiting on set proposed five we, and that we accept. Um, Sandra, are you prepared to? Uh, um, I am prepared to separate the, the two out. Yeah. That makes it. That's makes great. it people, so yeah. your, your standing proposal would be that we reject 5.1, isn't that yeah. correct? Yes, that's right. correct. That's correct. Um, content with that, um, Alderman McCready? Yes, Chair. So, okay. yeah, uh, okay. I think we're said on 5.1. I think all the points stand. I think it would oh, be. Okay. You happy for me to continue on the remainder or finish up with this one and then uh, point two? Uh, no, I think we, we'll, we'll sit on 5.1 for the moment, if that's okay with you. And I want to bring uh, Councillor Doyle in. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm heartened to see that there's um, a, a consensus emerging around this because it's certainly my and, and our perspective that um, we don't need this. Uh, we don't need an increase uh, in our allowance. There are people um, out there who are working absolutely flat out um, for nurses who are being offered a measly pay raise. Um, and we should uh, and can only we should and can only stand in solidarity with them um, if uh, we reject this. Um, I would urge all members to do the same. And, and even though I'm not a member of this committee, I'm fully in support of uh, rejecting 5.1. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Doyle. We will, of course, have the opportunity to uh, 
voting on it again when it comes for approval of the, uh, the minutes from this meeting at full council. Uh, I note that Councillor Fleming has seconded uh, Councillor Duffy's proposal that we reject 5.1. Uh, Councillor Riley. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Chair, for bringing me in. I suppose just in, they've been split now, but uh, when Councillor Duffy was making the initial proposal uh, of uh, 5.1 and then looking at 5.2.3, uh, that was similar to where we were at in terms of um, coming out to today's meeting. Uh, I don't think it's right that, as has been said, uh, we have frontline workers that has be, that have been offered an abysmal uh, pay increase for the work that they have done throughout the pandemic, uh, and uh, understanding uh, where the the recommendation has came from is not coming from um, you know our own officers. It's it, it's the 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 scheme presented to us by the Department of Communities. Uh, so happy to you know to record support for not going with 5.1 um, and then we we'll come to 5.2 in due course i'm sure chair thank you uh, thank you councillor riley uh, i'm going to take the first proposal that we have in front of us so there, there appears to be a unanimity uh, around that proposal uh, can i just have it quickly on that i think the proposal is we reject 5.1 uh, simple on that that's it yeah yep uh, do, do we need it on screen? Members content. Uh, the proposal is reject 5.1. Members content. It has been proposed, seconded. Uh, all seem content. Uh, therefore, declare that uh, we reject 5.1 as passed. Moving now to 5.2 uh, and inviting. Sandra back in again, followed by uh, Alderman McCready, followed by uh, anyone else who wishes to contribute then to the 5.2 issue. Uh, Sandra, thanks for doing. Thank you, Chair. And, and just to reiterate what I was saying in terms of um, 5.2 and the third element of it, I believe that when we looked at this initially, we looked at where the greatest workload was in terms of council responsibility and individual councillors work and we had agreed that that was within the planning committee um which was why that we took the original decision now i understand why um we haven't been able to follow through on it but if we are going to reallocate that money i would like to explore further how we remunerate members of the planning committee in terms of their their workload so I, I would be more content in focusing on the third element in terms of the planning committee at this stage. Thank you. Um, presuming then that the proposal is that we accept 5.2 whilst examining uh, further the third option, would that be a fair interpretation, Councillor Duffy? Yeah, I would be content with that. Okay, uh, if we can have that on screen. Moving then to Alderman McCready. Thank you, Chair. So the, on 5.2, well, firstly, I, I'm uncomfortable in general. I don't think that members should be presiding over making decisions on financial allowances in this case. In general, I, I very much would see it as a Department of Communities responsibility. Now, I, I understand that that's not the case, that we are where we are in terms of the protocol. Uh, in this case, that we've been given the recommendation uh, I, I'm still not happy about it. Um, so I'm going to separate that and park that for a moment because there's nothing we can really do to change that at the moment. But we, what we can do is well, we made a decision in council to um, look at the workload in terms of the uh, audit uh, committee in terms of how many times it would sit. That was reduced. Uh, consequentially, the alliances reflected that, which, <laughs> which created this... Um, on allocation of six thousand pound. Now, whilst I agree that the workload for the planning committee members is exceptional, it is beyond the, the almost the remit of part-time counselling um, in terms of that alliance. But nonetheless, the alliances were set based on all of that, and it was us as a council who made the decision to with, with, uh, reduce that workload from the the said committee. Sorry, the uh, the audit committee. But I, I still, I'm still uncomfortable that now we've got that six thousand pound uh, on allocation. 
yes, you know, it would seem fair that it would go to the planning uh, committee members, which, you know, I principally agree, but I, I don't think we can do that. Well, firstly, that the Department of Communities will not allow the existing uh, policies to go over and exceed a certain point of alliances. Now, on the, the 5.2, on your third paragraph, then there will be, I think, issues, which I'm sure you will look at, is uh, disparity and parity, which may become an issue. So there's no, it's not set. There will be members on the planning committee who may have other uh, special areas of responsibility and other committees and so on. So everyone's going to have a different baseline of what the alliance is for that particular year. And on what I read in this is about, you look at the 50% of members and then ro rotationally uh, split that money amongst them as year goes on. It just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a good fit. It, and I understand it's perceivably, but if I was looking in and there was a £6,000 uh, gap, which we created because we're refining uh, how we operate and function within committees, which is great, but that should be a saving to the ratepayer. I don't necessarily look and say, well, hang on, how do we then spread that across councillors again? Notwithstanding that the planning committee are exceptionally busy, but then if we make that decision to allocate that them on a rotational basis. I think it looks very messy and very murky. So I just need clarification from the council officer is that if we pursue and agree that the 5.2 third paragraph, you know, is it going to, how do you determine which, which half of the committee members get it first in the year one, you know, things. So I, I just think it could be better used somewhere else. And if we had that discretion to put it back to rate payers or a particular project somewhere, 6,000 pounds doesn't stretch very far, but I think it's uh, better off somewhere else than it is in councillors' pockets. And then, uh, if, if sorry, Alderman so McGrath, just for, for clarity, yeah. uh, you referred there a couple of times to the third paragraph. Are you referring to the third bullet point? Yes, Chair. I am. Uh, that's okay. Grant, thank you. Thank you. Any other member? No Chair, other please. member. Sorry, Chair, I was going, just going to come in. I know we'll put it in the chat box, but... Uh, oh, sorry, right. Uh, just, to, just to verbalise it as, as well. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, Councillor Duffy has outlined, um, you know, the, the various different reasons why those on the planning committee ha have additional tasks. And, and I'm not a member of the planning committee, but I have been in uh, some years ago. Uh, and I do know that the extra work, uh, the extra time off, from employment that counselors may have, uh, that involves them going then to go to site visits. Uh, you know, obviously, we can't do those now during the pandemic, but but back in the time when we, we were able to do site visits, they take up uh, significant portions of time. And then obviously the meeting itself uh, takes up significant time also. Uh, so, so I think there are good grounds why we should look at point three, um, bullet point three. I suppose in in relation to uh, Alderman McCready's points, uh, you know, I think that's the, the the particular issue that you know the the first few words of that bullet point says to de develop an approach, uh, and that's uh, where we were at. That we felt that the right thing to do was to was to proceed with uh, point three. Uh, so happy to support that, Chair. Thank you. Right, uh, Councillor Duffy has proposed. Uh, Paul, Councillor Fleming proposed the, sorry, seconded the uh, Sandra's first motion. Can I take it, Councillor, uh, that you're seconding uh, Sandra's second motion? Yeah, we absolutely. Accept, yeah. Right? Okay, so that's proposed and seconded. Uh, anyone else wish to speak to that particular motion? And mindful that we're looking at the bottom half there, that we accept 5.2 whilst examining further the third option. Anyone? Unhappy with that? Chair, yes. yes. Uh, Sorry. Um, right, members, I'm going to ask that we uh, we take a vote. Mr. Chief Executive, can we take us through that, please? Okay, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Alderman Braslin. Oh, of course, Alderman Braslin is in the yeah. office. That's right. Um, sorry, Alderman Hussey. Or Alderman McCready. Yeah, I'm going to abstain on this one. Thank you. Councillor Michaela Boyle. Or John. Councillor Michael Cooper.
Councillor Cooper still with us? Nope. Councillor Donnelly? In. Councillor Duffy? Councillor Fleming? Or John? Councillor McKeever? Or John? Councillor Mooney? John, Councillor Mooney has removed himself as he's a member of the Talent Committee. He's removed himself. Sorry, I didn't pick that one up. Thank you. And Councillor Riley? For John. Thank you. Chair, that is six for, none against, and two abstentions. So that proposal is carried. Uh, thank you, Chief Executive. Uh, proposal carried, both proposals carried, uh, item 10 dealt with. Uh, can I ask that those in the lobby be brought back in and that Councillor Mooney be informed to come back in if he wishes? Yeah. Thanks, Chair. I let Councillor Mooney know. That's good. Thank you. Waiting on you, host, to let us know if those guys are back in. Okay, I'm all right now. All right, Alan, you're back in. Alan's back in, okay. Is John back in, John Boyle? Not yet. John's back in, okay. Is waiting on Paul and John. Uh, it appears that uh, Councillor Boyle and uh, Councillor Gallagher have removed themselves. Are members content if we go ahead? They, they were uh, brought into the lobby by the host. Chair. But, hello, yes. Chair, it's Councillor Donnelly here. Uh, Councillor Gallagher yes. just off the phone asked me were we still on the same... Uh, oh, right, right. Time to come on because ahead. He thought we might have had forgot about him or something. But, <laughs> is it a matter if I'm rejoining or is it... Yes. Uh, can it be? Yeah, okay. I'll let him know. Thank you. And um, could somebody let Councillor John Boyle know then to come back in? Yeah, Chair, we'll do, we'll do that, yeah. Okay. Uh, if members are content, I'm going to go ahead. Um, through you, Chair. Yeah, the 11 service delivery. Yes, through you, uh, you. Chair. Um, the purpose of this report is to present for members' consideration and approval the delivery plan for the strategic planning and support services for the year 21 22. Um, as members would be aware, the, the delivery plans are an element of the Council's planning and improvement framework, and we have a standardised template, uh, details of which are proposed or set out in the report. Um, all of the directorates actually produce annually uh, one of these delivery plans, and obviously the other uh, directors will take um, their plans to the relevant committees. Um, in terms of the particular document attached to uh, Appendix 1, there is an overview of the purpose of the uh, strategic planning support services, the details of the services provided, an update in relation to last year, and the key priorities, actions, and associated measures of success for 21 22. Um, the, cell, the recommendation in front of members then today is the subject to members' comments that this particular uh, delivery plan is approved. Thank you, Chair. Members? Any questions to Ellen? None in the chat box. That being the case, can I have a proposal for the recommendation? Proposed, Chair. Sean, 
Councillor Mooney proposing. I can second for Alderman, uh, Alderman McCready seconded. Proposed and seconded members, all content. No deviation from that. Uh, declare that recommendation passed. Um, moving to item 12. Uh, that's you again, isn't it? Yes, uh, through you, Chair. Uh, the purpose of this report is to seek members' approval for the proposed schedule of meetings for the 21-22 year. As uh, Ellen, before you, before you go through all of that, uh, I'm sure members have looked at that and it's uh, very complex. Compre yeah. Proposed, Councillor Boyle, have a seconder. I'm not sure who that was. Uh, Alan Breslin. Alan, uh, Alderman Breslin seconded. And I'm sure members realise it's a guidance list. It's not set in stone if circumstances uh, emerge around any particular meeting. Uh, so we have that sitting in front of us. Recommendation on item 12 proposed and seconded. Don't hear any to the contrary, so I'm declaring that item 12 recommendations passed. Remote working, uh, Paula? Thank you, Chair. Uh, the purpose of this report is to update members on how we plan to progress our remote working policy and to seek endorsement on the approach outlined. Um, the current COVID pandemic has resulted in many staff having to very quickly adapt to new ways of working, including working remotely. In line with government guidelines, many of our employees continue to work from home when they, where they can. This has involved embracing new technology, communicating with teams and colleagues in a different way, and be more creative in how we deliver our services. So the key issues, the rapid change in a short space of time has given us the opportunity to reflect on how and where we work and how to evaluate our overall approach to working so we don't simply revert to the way we worked previously once all restrictions have been lifted. While it's recognised that there will always be a requirement for employees to be present in the workplace in order for services to be effectively delivered, it is also acknowledged that many employees, mainly those in office-based roles, are able to carry out many of their duties from home. It's therefore proposed that a policy in remote working is developed in consultation with the senior leadership team, employees and trade unions. And there are no financial, legal or other implications associated with this report at this time. It's recommended that members endorse the approach outlined in the report and further updates will be provided in due course. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Paula. Uh, Councillor Doyle. Thank you, Chair, and appreciate your indulgence as I'm not a member of the committee. Um, delighted to see this. Um, I think it is uh, and will be welcomed by staff, but obviously we have to go through um, unions and everything else. The one question that I have Chair, and it brings me to a conversation that I had with the Chief Executive not that long ago. As part of the city, we've obviously um, looked at relocating the council offices um, to up and around Foy Street. Um, has any, I know the, the conversation is only starting around this aspect of it, but surely we don't need an office the size we have now currently in the Strand Road if we're going to be potentially offering this uh, option to staff. Um, and obviously that will cost less, which will give us more money to do other things with. So I'm interested to hear um, if that's going to feed into that conversation, um, because obviously there could be real uh, benefits to having um, a remote working policy in place that will then feed into our capital uh, investments in the long term. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Doyle. And don't forget we have council officers in Shaban as well, uh, which are very suitable for uh, our, our staff to go into. Uh, Alderman McCready. Thank you, Chair. I uh, welcome and endorse uh, the report, so thank you very much for it. I think it's quite timely. And <clears throat> that approach going forward, uh, Councillor Doyle outlines a big question. I think it should be fundamental within this approach that it's a big decision, big implications. When you look across the majority of sectors, whether it's commercial, civil, anywhere else, there is a culture change. We've been forced into it by COVID-19. And as a result, we will have a hybrid working environment in a way, whether it's some online, some physical, a uh, combination of both. Um, but having a policy which outlines the framework of that so that we can use council officers can literally look at the operational delivery of that. Um, I'm keen on it. But if it's something where we have, yeah, I recall 
you know, maybe a year ago or two years ago when I came into council, you're talking about capacity within buildings because we're delivering so much as a council, then, you know, we're trying to stop people in offices, but then people in offices are not, um, you know, that's not what you'd equate to output. You know, we can do many things remotely or as a hybrid, as I say. So I look forward to that approach and I'd be keen for feedback to members specifically on the point where it's connected to the city deal as outlined by member Doyle. And like, is there still a requirement in terms of the, the lay down, the office space, et cetera, et cetera. But thank you very much for the report. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alderman uh, McCready. I don't see anybody else wishing to come in. Uh, Chief Executive, uh, yep, see you. you put sure. your camera on there. Do you want in? <laughs> yeah, happy, very happy to come in, Chair. And those are um, very good points raised by both uh, Councillor Doyle and Alderman McCready. Um, the um, the potential office space that we may require going forward is an absolute driver for this report. So it is one of the reasons why this report is in front of you today. Um, and the timing couldn't be better, members. Um, so we wish to look at this report for a number of reasons. Um, one, uh, benefit to our employees in terms of flexible working going forward. Uh, but two, and very importantly, as you've highlighted, to inform our accommodation needs uh, going forward. Um, there is, of course, the narrative at this moment in time that everyone will downsize in terms of their accommodation needs. Where we were at uh, um, prior to the pandemic was that we needed a radical um, increase in accommodation. Um, I suspect as we go forward, we will still need additional accommodation, but perhaps quite not as much as we had previously anticipated. And therefore, um, we have, um, we are proposing to you today that we undertake this work partly uh, to uh, understand that accommodation need. Just with regard to both the Strand Road and Derry and indeed Derry Road and Strabane, there are a whole range of issues that will drive that decision. Um, most notably the issue to uh, stimulate wider uh, regeneration. And we're also in conversation with central government in terms of their accommodation needs uh, and and the possibility of co-locating um, with other functions. So um, I suppose the short answer to the original question is most definitely uh, it will inform our needs going forward. Uh, and we wish to conduct and conclude this exercise in a timely manner in parallel with uh, developing those proposals. And we um, look forward to bringing uh, to you members uh, in the not too distant future, hopefully, um, both progress on this policy and also uh, how it might inform those accommodation needs going forward. Uh, thank you, Chief Executive. And you've mentioned the Derry Road offices in Strahan. Uh, I'm sure members are also mindful that there are proposals within the city deal and the, the uh, the uh, canal basin, etc., for uh, council provision in that area as well. So that will, I presume, all fit into the overall scheme as we move forward and get the jigsaw put together. Uh, we have the report and recommendations. Can I have a proposal for the recommendations, please? Item 13, have I a proposal? To accept the recommendation. Derek, uh, was that the one we just discussed about the new policy? Remote, remote yeah. work. Remote work. Sorry. Make something okay. I'm happy to propose it or accept it. Thank you, Alderman McCready. I was wondering while well, the supporter was getting the new proposer and seconder. Uh, Councillor Boyle. Yeah. Councillor Boyle seconding. Proposed and seconded. Uh, members agreed. Thank you, members. Business manager is Rachel, are you taking this one? Yeah, I'll be quick, Chair, and conscious okay. of the last for decision. So um really the purpose yeah, of item, this item 14. Yeah. The purpose of this report is to seek members' endorsement of the Carnegie UK Trust's embedding wellbeing in Northern Ireland uh, projects, emerging draft recommendations, and to issue correspondence to the communities minister in relation to the recommendations. As members are aware, uh our Derry City and Strabane District Strategic Growth Partnership or Community Plan and Partnership was successful together with uh, two other uh, Northern Ireland Community Plan and Partnerships, Armand Bambridge and Craig Alvin and Lisburn and Castlereagh. 
So we've been working with Carnegie since 2018, um, where they've provided financial and in-kind support to us as community planners, moving forward to implement the wellbeing outcomes approach, um, basically along two themes on co-production and shared leadership. They've helped us with the natural capital account. Um, they've helped us with the participatory budgeting process and also the development of a community engagement strategy, as well as a shared leadership program and uh, ways to work with co-production. Um, so they have put forward a number of recommendations, basically from their experience of working with community planning in Northern Ireland. And the, the recommendations are detailed in sections uh, 3.8 to 3.10 of your reports. Uh, there's no real direct financial or other implications arising from this report chair. It was raised at SOLAS um, in, in February, and it was agreed that this will be put into each of the individual councils for, for, for consideration or recommendation. So, Chair, quickly, the recommendation before you today is that uh, the members endorse the draft recommendations outlined in 3.8 to 3.10 of your report, and that we issue a correspondence to the community's uh, minister in relation to that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, members? Nobody in the chat box? Uh, uh, Chair, happy to oppose Councillor Riley. Propose Councillor Riley. Happy, happy to second. second. Yeah. You can pick up on that, Nula. I'm not sure who it was, but it's proposed and seconded. Uh, just a brief comment from myself. I'm delighted to see the recommendation uh, reference regeneration responsibility and more particularly funding moving to local government. I remember uh, at the very beginning of, of the new local government arrangements that we were promised uh, regeneration of powers. Uh, the concern was, you know, OK, we'll get the powers, but we're going to get funding to go along with it. And then, of course, the, the government reneged and withdrew uh, that uh, promise of regeneration powers going to local government. So I'm delighted to see that particular recommendation on there, particularly as it highlights uh, not alone just the responsibility for regeneration, but the funding to go along with it. And that has to be adequate funding and, and not something whereby uh, government at Storm and says, right, we're given regeneration, we're given a win of pence to get on with. It's got to be appropriate funding to the job that we're required to do. It's proposed and seconded. I don't hear any to the contrary. Members agreed. Uh, agreed. Thank you, members. The next items 15 to 19 are for information. I'm check. I'm looking at the chat box, and is there any particular item in the open for information items 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19? If members are content, we're moving to confidential. So can I ask uh, IT to take us offline, please? And let so us know. Propose, sure. propose we're going to committee. Councillor Reddy. Seconded, Sean. And 